Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to the July 15, 2019 Sparklands <coughs> meeting. First, we will have public comment. Do you want, that's you, Susan, you want to? <laughs> you can um, actually just come right over here. We've got the wireless mics there. Turn the top of the mic. There you go. There, that's better. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Just mention your name and where you live. Okay. Good evening. My name is Susan Witcher. I live at Boar's Head up on Hampton Beach. And I'm here asking for your help. Let me help my, my, my name is Gordon Witcher, I'm her husband, let me help her a little bit. Uh, Gordon, just sit in that other chair yeah. there if you'd like. Yeah. About two and a half years ago, my wife had a stroke, and uh, she is uh, ongoing uh, recovery, uh, and part of that recovery is uh, access to the beach, and that is what she is here to ask for. Uh, we live in, on Boar's Head. There is uh, handicap access at 18th Street, uh, as well as on the main beach. But uh, what we have found is the handicap access at 18th Street is heavily used, very difficult to find parking. And what my wife has uh, is, is requesting is that a handicap access be added to the first entrance. That's the first entrance through the seawall at Hampton Beach, I mean at um, right next to Boys Head, you know, next to Boys Head on, on okay. North Beach. Uh -huh. So let me turn it over from here. <laughs> okay. the, the reason we think the first entrance is a great one because there's a large landing area from where the stairway is back to where there's a chain access, perfect place for a ramp that'll come down uh -huh. and that will allow not only my wife to have uh, access to the beach with family and friends, uh, but also a number of our uh, friends that live in that general area that are uh, mobility restricted. I refer to my wife as mobility restricted. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but to be able to enjoy the benefits of the beach during the summer. So what would you like to add? That's pretty much it. it the stairs, there's big rocks at the base of the stairs since they're pretty wobbly. Oh. And there's a lot of little rocks and not very secure. It's similar to the way other conditions that were down at that yeah. north end. Susan's lived here for many, many years, mm -hmm. too. She, you know, she's lived there on Boar's Head, so mm -hmm. she's always enjoyed it. And I didn't miss going. <laughs> <laughs> And, and it wouldn't just benefit her, it's right. a benefit for yes. people but in that area. People. Sure. Yes. Yeah. And it's, it's not only people that are mobility restricted, right. but also young families with lots and lots of little kids, yeah. with, wheel, you know, with baby chairs. carriages and all that jazz. Yep. So uh, there's one at, on 18th Street, which is kind of on the north end mm -hmm. of North Beach, and we're requesting consideration for something similar to be built at the first entrance uh, uh, through the seawall. Yeah. And there's another lady that lives in the very first house or second house that she is has mm -hmm. the same limitations as Susan and of course yeah. you've got Dave from Dave's garage yeah lives there also mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so there's, there's about seven or eight I was counting them up in my head yeah people that can't get to the beach like me well we appreciate that you came in tonight to tell us about I, this I, and bring bring it forward we appreciate it no thanks <laughs> But listening. <laughs> Thank did, you so much. Okay. Did you folks come down in the uh, elevator? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Other uh, pub people for public comment? Um, 
you can or you can stand, either oh. one. Whatever you prefer. Yeah, you can I'll sit. sit if you don't yeah, mind. that's great. <laughs> I love that you have a chair for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, for the record, my name is Anne Marie Banfield. I moved to Hampton about a year ago from Bedford. I was there for 16 mm -hmm. years, and I haven't looked back. <laughs> I love this town. I love this area. So I want to thank you for allowing me to speak um, and thoughtfully considering what I have to bring you tonight. Um, so I'm just now kind of getting into the groove of what's going on in Hampton mm -hmm. and enjoying the beaches and following the Facebook pages. And everybody speaks very highly, and we see the great things going on in this town. Um, but there's been a few posts on social media that indicate, and some things we've seen, that on the beaches, for instance, really Fourth of July, and you probably are already aware of this, I just kind of want to reiterate that, you know, there are things going on in the beaches that I think need a, a little more attention. For instance, the alcohol use or abuse. Um, the drug usage, uh, and this has been posted on social media by people who were at Hampton Beach, and I don't know the particulars because I haven't been in this town very long, but it seems to me that maybe if there's a bigger police presence, especially in South Beach, that this could be <coughs> alleviated, especially on the 4th of July weekend, and then maybe on the weekends during the busy season. I don't, obviously, this doesn't need to be, I think, addressed all year long. Um, we know that, you know, the population decreases off season. But I notice that there's a lot of people who look to come to Hampton, um, you know, and they post, you know, hey, we're looking to come there for a vacation, we're bringing our family, where do you suggest to stay? And so if these are out there on social media where other residents are seeing problems, I'm wondering how that's going to impact the people who are, who, you know, put the residents up for rent mm -hmm. or the hotels or the restaurants. Um, and as a Hampton resident, it concerns me. Um, so I just wanted to bring that to your attention. For instance, like, and I think, again, it just, it's just going to take a little more police presence. Uh, I drove down to Rye Beach a couple months ago, and I parked in an old parking spot. <laughs> and the sign was right there, and I just didn't see it, darn it. And I got a $50 fine. And we paid it. And guess what? I'm going to be so much more aware the next time I drive down to Wright Beach. <laughs> Those things, if you find people, if there's you know, something done where somebody's actually breaking the law, then I think they're going to think twice about it. But if it's ignored, or maybe it's not even ignored, maybe there's just not enough resources right now to address this. But if it's, if it's handled properly, I think that, you know, that's going to help the image also of, of Hampton Beach. Um, I also am concerned about property values when, when, when this stuff is out there. You know, we have, you know, we bought our property um, in, in our neighborhood, Hampton Meadows. A house is selling a day. In a day, it's it, because this is such a great area that I'm like, I kind of want to keep it that way <laughs> and not have to worry about, you know, something causing, you know, some, you know, maybe crimes escalating yeah. and causing that to in, impact our property values. And then finally, um, well, one, two more points I want to bring up. We have a four minute. Four minute, minute. okay. Just two more here. points. Um, I'm sure you've probably heard of the broken window theory, that when you kind of ignore the little crimes, then you run the risk of having bigger crimes. And I yeah. think when it's, when it's addressed, we don't have that concern. Um, or we won't have that concern because it'll be addressed. And then the last point I want to make, and again, thank you for listening, is maybe we need to make our state representatives and our senator, <laughs> I saw that, aware that this is important to, to, to Hampton residents. I will say that for four minutes. Thank um, you. To Hampton residents. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing public comment? Seeing none, we'll move on to announcements and community calendar. Well, the community calendar is next. Announcements right. and community calendar. Did you want to? Well, one thing I want to say that to this nice lady. Where uh, we do not I want interact. Give me a call or email me because I have other. I want to ask you some questions. Did you want to call um, announcements and community calendar? No, Regina. I would like announcements and community calendar. Right. I have a few. 
Fourth of July was a success as usual. I thank the Hampton Police Department, Hampton Fire Department, Hampton Public Works, New Hampshire State Troopers, and the Rockingham County Sheriffs, New Hampshire State Parks, and of course all the visitors that were at the beach. That was July 4th weekend. Um, last week I was able to get a tour of the New England Trade School because I missed out on their opening and I want to say that I was very impressed. The guys, they took me through everything. The workshops, all hands-on learning, I think it's going to be very good and positive for Hampton, as I know we've already discussed that as a board. And um, remind everyone, tomorrow night at the Half Shell, we're having a, uh, a in honor of Rick Middleton, a former Bruins player who is a Hampton mm -hmm. resident. It's a free night. We're hoping to bring everyone from all over town back to the beach for a night. So if you can stop by 8 o'clock at the Half Shell. That's all I have. Mr. Waddell. All set. Thanks. Um, yeah, I would uh, also like to thank uh, everyone for keeping the beach up as nice as it's been. Um, to the north end of the beach has been beautiful. Uh, even tonight on the way, one thing I noticed on the white way here tonight, there was someone walking down the, not the middle of the road, but onto the side of the road, on the inside of the line in the road. And I thought, I wonder why they're doing that. And I looked, it was so, it, it was so apparent that the road is much better to walk on than the sidewalks. And the guys <laughs> walking in the road just because there wasn't any traffic, but it does look nice down there. Next, we have approval of minutes for July 1st, 2019. Public and non-public, and I will so move. Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. We have the consent agenda. Banner, sign license, cemetery deed, heritage commission appointment, license Four Coin Operated Amusements, Pride Parade and Public Gathering License for the Hampton Rotary Beer Tent, the uh, raffle permit uh, for the Hampton Historical Society and the pool table permit. I'll move the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor? Mr. Chairman, just before we do uh, number five, uh, can we separate that out and then uh, where, where the uh, Children's Festival is okay. part of the... Uh, so Chamber. all except for number five, we have a motion and a second. And a second, yeah. And all those in favor? Unanimous. What are we Everyone doing? Abstention. I'll make a motion to move number five. Okay. And I'll second it. Uh, all those in favor? And one abstention. Four and one. Um, next, we move on to the legislatures. Please join us up here at the table. Whoever's. Jason, evening. Jason, you're not at Scout Camp? I just came from Scout Camp. Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, before we start, I just want to have a shout out to all the Scout parents that are at home. Uh, your Scout's doing really well at New Valley Scout Camp. I left this morning in New Valley. We're very happy and very safe. Thank you for joining us here tonight. Welcome. Uh, here we have Senator Tom Sherman, um, uh, Pat Pushway, uh, Pushway, um, and Ran um, Randy Cushing. Randy Cushing. I've only known him for thirty years. Tom <laughs> Laughlin, forty, and Jason Janbrand. Go with thirty, Rick. It's better. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's 40. Um, Jason, so, Jason came all the way up from Seabrook. Yes, I know. Um, would you like to start, Senator Sherman? Uh, sure. Let me just, you had, yeah. in the request, you had talked about talking about legislation for next session. But if it's possible, I'd like to just give a brief yeah. recap of last session. Um, I see that we're not all here. So I'll talk about all the issues that. Um, that we worked on. Yeah, I, he's, he's got a mind. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, on the Senate side, um, most of the issues that I had hoped to address um, have been addressed. 
And the most exciting part of that is that they were addressed in a very bipartisan way. Um, so when you think of, in terms of here, the mental health issues, substance use disorder issues, um, and those have gone through with mental health, we've uh, had lots of successes. Um, I had 11 prime sponsored bills and seven are going to the governor's desk. He will have signed five as of uh, tomorrow. Um, and there's two more to go. Um, but the, the, one of the top priorities that I had was ending the practice of ER boarding, which is where somebody in mental health crisis will go into the emergency room and then be stuck there because we don't have enough beds statewide for people who are a danger to themselves or others. Um, okay. And SB 11, I was prime sponsor. We had a lot of support <coughs> both sides. It passed out of the Senate uh, unanimously. Um, and the governor, the uh, House, same thing, and the governor signed it, and that's actually going into action right now. And it's comprehensive. What it does is it builds, or it uh, uses surplus funds to create more beds for that particular population. Mm. But that's not the whole problem. Uh, of course, the problem of <coughs> mental health in New Hampshire and how we deal with it is comprehensive. So this is not meant to be a long-term solution, but it does address uh, the people who are in crisis before they get to the hospital and creates uh, a uh, uh, mobile crisis team, and that was Senator Bradley's addition. Okay. Uh, and then on the other side of the hospital, it creates more beds for people to go to. So the hospital, you know, the hospital can actually, when somebody is ready to be transferred out of the acute mental hospital, they can go to step down care. That opens up more beds. So this is. Uh, this is really important legislation. It, we see this at uh, Exeter Hospital more than Portsmouth because Portsmouth already has uh, some of those kinds of beds. The good news is that I'm meeting with the CEO at Portsmouth tomorrow, and uh, we should be, they, they will be adding at least eight to ten beds uh, by October hmm. at Portsmouth. So for our community, that is a huge resource. That will give them 20 what are called DRF beds for people who are in acute mental health crisis. Uh, and that's as a result of this bill and the funding that's attached to it. Other, um, other efforts that have been specifically for Hampton, since Mike is not here, I'll mention on the House side, uh, many of you were aware and supported, uh, as did the Chamber, the idea of this $2 occupancy fee. Mm -hmm. And that made it through the House, and when it got to the Senate, it was, uh, it and Hampton were pretty aggressively attacked uh, to, uh, this was a new tax, it was, uh, it was unnecessary, we should just raise property taxes if we want to have more money uh, for uh, our tourist infrastructure. It was hugely supported, as you can imagine, by places like Portsmouth, all down the seacoast, Conway, Keene, um, but in some of the major cities like Manchester, Nashua, it didn't have as much support um, and it, it uh, was tabled as a result. It was not going to pass. Um, and one of the issues to discuss possibly is whether or not to bring it back in a possibly different, different form. Since Mike filed it and it didn't make it through the Senate, he can't refile it for the next session, yes, can. but I can. Oh, he can? Okay, he told me he can. So, <laughs> he can. But I can as well. Um, so if that's still a high priority, and I can work with the chamber as well. Uh, one of the major pushbacks was from campgrounds, um, and there were some specific changes that we could make it to make it more palatable. But it does represent a, a lot of potential income. Remember, it was enabling, so it would be up to the select board in the town to decide whether or not to actually do it. Um, the biggest news is, of course, the budget, uh, which was a uh, uh, the budget was passed through the, from the governor to the house, uh, and then from the house to the senate, and then the senate and the house came together and actually worked with the governor's office to create um, the final budget that passed the legislature. <coughs> uh, 
the single major sticking point is whether or not to continue with business profits tax um, cuts or not. And uh, the legislature position, and, and we can all chime in on this, uh, the, the position of the legislature, uh, of the Senate and the House from the Committee of Conference, was that we have essentially four major crises in the state. We have a strong economy in the center, but we have four major crises, and these are education. We have towns in the state who are cutting their foreign language programs, their PE programs, and yet their property taxes are through the roof mm. because they just don't have the wherewithal. Uh, they, they can't increase their property taxes anymore. Their property taxes are so high that they can't even sell their homes. It's this catch-22. Um, and those are towns like Claremont and Berlin and others. And we are starting to see the lawsuits starting. We have two pending against the state now. Uh, in DCYF, the, the national standard for caseloads for caseworkers, this is the Department of Child and Youth, Youth and Family Services, the, um, the caseload for these children nationally would be 12 to 1. In New Hampshire, it's 45 to 1. That's a crisis. These are children who are, um, have been identified as being at risk, either because of neglect or abuse. And um, as many of you know, children have been seriously hurt or <coughs> injured or actually have died while under the watch of DCYF over the last several years. <coughs> we are starting to see the lawsuits. The statewide liability has been estimated to be upwards of 10 to $20 million at the very least mm -hmm. if, uh, if we don't. And, and of course, the human liability is through the roof when you think of all those children. One response to this was SB4, Senator Morgan's bill, that actually uh, allots enough money for enough um, caseworkers that we'll actually get to the 12 to 1. Mm. The problem is that money is tied up in the budget. So that money isn't going through. Um, the, fourth, the third major crisis is mental health. Mental health is, uh, as many of you are aware, it's not other people, it's our families, all of our families. Uh, I give talks at UNH, and when I ask how many of you have been affected with mental health or substance use, every hand in the room goes up. Um, and we've certainly seen it here, we've seen it down in Seabrook, and SB 11 was a great start, but um, the budget is absolutely required to bring up levels of Medicaid reimbursement for Seacoast Mental Health and for Families First, because without that, they are actually on the margin of, of not being able to provide services. Right now, if you go to Seacoast Mental Health with a standard mental health issue and you need help, the next available appointment is December. <laughs> they have 15 clinical openings right now. They can't recruit, they can't retain. And it's because we are one of the lowest in the nation for our reimbursement of Medicaid. And that's what these federally qualified centers actually depend on, is the Medicaid funding to be at least at a base level that would allow them to survive. Um, in the budget, the request was $60 million to increase Medicaid uh, funding, but it, the final budget was $30 million at the governor's request. Uh, so it goes up, but it doesn't go up enough. And he vetoed um, one of the bills, SB 5, I believe, that would have provided the stopgap funding from January 1 to July 1 because he said it would be in the budget and, and then, the veto, then the budget was vetoed. These are just, this is the situation we're facing right now. The fourth uh, crisis is substance use disorders. We have a federal grant, a series of federal grants that are two-year grants that will <coughs> expire at the end of next year. That's where this doorways, and, um, you know, our nearest, our doorway or our hub and spoke, our hub for Hampton is Dover, Wentworth Douglas Hospital. Oddly enough, the hub for Exeter, the hospital, is Manchester, um, which is a head-scratcher for me. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and it creates an entirely new system of substance use treatment when so many of the patients already have a mental illness as well. And so, but it's two systems dealing with uh, problems that are very tightly intertwined. Um, so there is some redundancy, and I'm hoping we can you know, right size that a bit so that they work in tandem much better. But that remains a crisis. We've seen cuts in recovery services. We've seen uh, SOS that was hoping to come in to Hampton at the last minute. One of their major uh, funding sources was put on hold by DHHS, and they, um, they had to use private loans to actually move ahead with Hampton pending DHHS uh, coming through with their grant. Um, I did get reassurance from the commissioner who I talked to about that specifically, that that grant money will come through, so they'll be made whole, and so SOS can move forward. So when you look at the, the budget in total, the major sticking point right now is the governor would like to see hit the continued tax cuts. We've gone from 8.5% to 7.9%. No one is saying it should go up. But January 1st of this year, the rate which would be payable in spring of 2020 <coughs> was to go to 7.7%. Uh, that would cost the state 93 million or $90 million per biennium in this biennium, $130 million if the tax cuts continue in the next biennium. And if that happens, responses to those four crises will have to be cut. And that's the sticking point. So that's what they met last Thursday. I'm not a part of those meetings. I don't think any of you all are either. I did talk to uh, some leadership yesterday and said, you know, right now the community mental health centers have been three months at a sharp cut in their Medicaid re funding because of the way the state shifted their contracts. And now we're looking at another, I'm sorry, six months. Now we're looking at another three months. That's nine months of a sharp cut in reimbursement that is already the lowest, one of the lowest in the country. That's why this is so important. Um, and um, the good news, I think, is that they're, they are talking. Uh, the bad news is that New Hampshire residents are hurting and many of the great Bipartisan, I mean, we have so much agreement. Many of these great initiatives, like SB 14, which provides comprehensive care for children uh, in mental health and supports in prenatal health and all these others, again, unanimous vote out of the Senate went to the House and did extremely well. Um, these are funded through the budget. So nothing is happening with these big efforts. <coughs> Um, and then finally, I don't know if you want to talk about what's happening with education, but uh, that was one of the big priorities of the House. And without a budget, we're looking at uh, an additional cut, and I'll let you guys talk about that. But from the Senate standpoint, um, we have made great bipartisan strides, and we need to see the funding to support it. And Believe it or not, the funding for those bipartisan strides was supported, but it sits in the budget, which is currently on hold. So right now we're, we're operating under a continuing resolution that will go three months. And what that means is that we, are, we can tap into the surplus through SB 11, because that's already law. It's been signed by the governor. But um, all of the, nothing else changes. The, the funding stays at last year's levels um, until the budget is passed. Okay, and uh, Pat, why don't you introduce yourself or, and what you have to say? Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm Representative Pat Bushway. And um, so uh, before we go on with, with um, the continuation on the budget, I wanted to go back to the issue of um, Mike Edgar's attempt to um, get the uh, the the increase the the uh, the charge added to the nightly rate that didn't pass. It, you you perhaps recall that I also made an attempt. Uh, I I uh, 
put a bill in to add a not to exceed uh, 25 cent additional charge on the parking meters at, at the beach. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm sure Mr. Welch remembers that. Uh, uh, that also didn't pass um, in, in spite of my best efforts to, and, and it was kind of, there was a somewhat of a similar reaction of, you know, um, Hampton's, Hampton's doing fine. And we, I, I tried to make the case of um, it is in everyone's, it's, it's, a, it's a, a statewide best interest uh, to, to support Hampton Beach as well as we can. And Hampton does a tremendous job of that. And we need to be reimbursed for that, for the effort. And we need help with that. Um, and in, in spite of that, uh, it was still kind of seen as, you know, that's, that's, that's your problem. And so uh, it, it did not pass. Um, w again, you know, we can't, I don't know what we'll be able to do in terms of some kind of a similar attempt. Um, but, you know, we'll, we, we will try to do that. Um, Mike and I are also continuing to work with the Park Service um, uh, on related parking issues, we've heard from a number of hotel owners about uh, leased spaces and better access to to lease spaces. So, um, about a month ago or so, um, Chuck Rage and I met with Phil Bryce to talk about, you know, as an example, um, it, it, the Kentville is gone. We all know that you know that's that's no longer there, and they had 16 leased spaces. So we tried to make the case um, with, with the commissioner that uh, we, we could use those 16 spaces elsewhere, and should we not have access to do that. Uh, he, he was willing to listen to the discussion, and we're still trying to work that. Um, but with those, uh, again, it's the issue of we need to be supporting those people that are collecting that the, the those overnight charges. That's that's where we're generating the revenue. Um, so he, I I think he's he's willing to work with us. So we are continuing to work with um, with Phil Bryce on that issue and on the parking in general. Um, I I wanted to also make the point about a, a bill that uh, Jason and I worked on together that uh, you probably saw in the, the HB 324 um, that was signed into law that limits uh, the use of jet skis in the yes, Hampton Seabrook estuary. Yeah. Um, when it went in, uh, the, the attempt was to um, require the jet skis to maintain um, headway speed, meaning just the speed yeah. that's necessary to control the vessel. Yeah. Uh, what, what came to light uh, through the Conservation Commission was, um, and, and again, this was within 300 feet of any of the marsh areas, but what came to light that we found out um, subsequent to that was a 2007 ruling uh, that they were not allowed to be at any speed, they weren't allowed yeah. to be within 300 feet yeah. of uh, the marshes or any of the sidewalls, any of the areas. The uh, so the, the, the issue that we ran into with that when, when, when that was brought to light and Jason and I tried to resolve that, what we, what we uh, realized was the, in the ruling, the definition and the, there wasn't, clarity of exactly what what vessels, what the yeah. jet ski, what the personal watercraft definition was that that applied to. And we realized that that needed clarification. Yeah. Uh, so we worked through uh, the, the wording with that. We got a lot of help from the Marine Patrol. Um, Captain Dunlady was, uh, was, was very helpful with coming up with the right language to make sure mm -hmm. um, that we did capture the size of the vehicle, the the uh, the means of propulsion, the the way it's it's controlled, um, so that we can protect the the estuary the way it needs to be protected. Um, so we did get that passed, um, and it and it takes effect. It's it's in effect now. Good. That said, there will certainly be um, you know an education process that will have to take place, uh, but we're certainly better positioned to do that now. 
I also circled back with uh, our Conservation Commission to make sure that, you know, in, in, their, in, in their opinion, that we've covered all the bases on this now, and, and uh, I've heard back from them that, that we are good with that. So, um, so those are the things that I wanted to highlight uh, specific to, to what we're, what's going on here in Hampton. Good. Thank you. Rennie? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I was telling somebody that, you know, three weeks ago I felt like school got out and then now I'm going to summer school because uh, <laughs> without having a break. Because, you know, unfortunately I, I was a little disappointed that the budget, um, the budget ended up getting vetoed. Uh, in particular, there, there are some things in the budget that I, uh, I, I've worked on. Um, one thing I'm really glad is that there is money in the budget to build a new secure psychiatric hospital to treat people <coughs> with mental illness in a place other than the state prison. And I know that Dr. Sherman helped work on that. That's good. I hope no matter what happens in the resolution that that will remain in there. A couple of other things that I've been involved in that are um, involved, um, one of the things in involves the, the water, funding for the water projects that was, you know, it was originally an, uh, a standalone bill and as it passed initially, then it was put on the table so that it can get incorporated into the budget. There is, I think, a consensus that it's that it will be important to fund the water projects that will have a beneficial impact on Hampton if and when the budget gets passed. But I think that's I think that will be that will be, you know, some some good news. You know, I remember you know, I did manage to get through one committee the uh, you know, state 15% state contribution to uh, retirement cost that was again retained by the finance committee, um, and it became it, it, it's. I'd like to tell you it's going to come out with a recommendation next year, but I'm not going to lie to you. It's not <laughs> going to happen um, in part because there is a competing. It, it seems to be putting you know competing with funding for education, for lack of a better word. That's just the reality of it, and I. It's it's. It's just kind of hung up on there. Um, I do know Mike's not here, but one, the good news is that the capital budget did pass, and one of the things that is in the pipeline that's assured is that the dredging will go forward in Hampton Harbor in, I guess, November, whenever that, in November, and also there'll be money to dredge uh, rye, too. Mm -hmm. um, and for myself, I have a, you know, the, I end up being in the situation where there are five bills that I'd worked pretty for a long time, a few years on that when we went to recess, they were on their way to the governor's office. I don't know what the score is yet on, on some of them. Uh, but one of them is to clean up the Coakley landfill and to go back and prevent the toxins from migrating off site. I think there's a consensus that that's a good idea. I'm hoping the governor will sign it. He seems to be, you know, seems to be supportive of that. Um, and we'll wait and see, um, and I'll, I'll report back on that. And again, on the issues of the relating to the dealing with the mental health issues in the state, um, the governor has set up a uh, task force that Dr. Sherman and I have both been appointed. He represents the Senate. I represent the House. Mm -hmm. uh, that's headed up by the Commissioner of Corrections, and it involves the Commissioner of Health and Human Services and the Chief mm -hmm. Justice of the Supreme Court. That we're going to try to deal with the issues of the intersection of mental health care and the correction system, um, because one thing that's just not tenable is to have the New Hampshire Department of Corrections be the largest single provider of mental health care in the state, <coughs> which is the situation right now. And we don't really, Corrections is not designed as its primary mission to do mental health care. It's there to deal with, you know, to correct behavior. Um, and it's a big problem. But I think I'm optimistic that the governor's involvement in that and assigning uh, what I think is a pretty high level group of people with some knowledge that will be able to come forward with some ideas that will help, that will, will help improve the overall mental health care in the state, and I don't want to hog too much time, so I'll pass it on. <laughs> state Rep. Tom Laughlin. Good evening. State Rep. Tom Lockman. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, the first thing I got to work on uh, was HB 359. It's a bill I submitted to address uh, a, a known problem with the opioid crisis, perhaps a very underappreciated under problem. With all the federal funding that was coming in for treatment and recovery services, I wanted to focus on prevention in the first place. So we do know that most opioid misuse starts with opioid prescription misuse. 
And it turns out that 30% of people who are taking opioid uh, prescriptions didn't know they were taking an opioid. Oh, okay. As someone who works in uh, you know, safety and health and risk management, I have a great appreciation for just how much uh, we can improve decision making and habits when you understand the risks associated. How could you possibly do that if you don't know you're taking an opioid? Mm. There's a lot of reasons for that, which I won't get into, but um, what we did is put together a bill that requires the prescription medication bottle to have a sticker on top that says opioid. Good. And there's a, a handout developed by the Governor's Commission that we are uh, informing them of best practices used around the country. So it gets into what the risks are and how to mitigate them to keep yourself safe, your family safe, safe storage, safe timely turn-in. Um, it was quite an adventure for a first bill taking on uh, <laughs> lobbyists and um, it got even more interesting in the Senate, uh, so thank goodness for having a doctor in the Senate. Um, <laughs> Tom Bruce, Senator Sherman proved extremely uh, useful, a uh, great advocate for the bill, and we got it passed. It was signed by the governor on Friday. Good. That'll go into effect in January. Uh, and I, I do believe that will save lives. It'll prevent people from get, uh, misusing them in the first place, and it will prevent accidental relapse from happening, which we know has uh, yeah. cost lives. Uh, Senator Sherman shared many stories from the campaign trail um, that were uh, heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, we heard from Representative Cushing about cleaning up Coakley. Um, we're, you know, also interested in the safer drinking water standards of the mm -hmm. MCL, so that's going before the gel car uh, on Thursday. And so if you okay. get a chance, please reach out to the representatives and senators uh, on gel car and ask them to support the new proposal by DES. They are consistent with the latest science, and failure to do that is to expose children and communities to unsafe level of toxins in our water, and that's unacceptable. And just to add one mm -hmm. thing to that, uh, we have been notified by Aquarian that even under these new standards, Aquarian will be, uh, they will not need to do any remediation. So they already need these standards. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The new standards is what I'm talking yes. about. Mm -hmm. They will meet the new standards. Yeah, so that should give us a level of comfort in Hampton that we're in, in good shape. I um, want to talk about, you know, Hampton's fair share. We talked a lot about that uh, a couple of months back. And meals and rooms tax revenue, what we saw in the prior budget, the last biennium, um, the catch-up formula, so it's supposed to be 40%, hasn't been in a long time. So a catch-up formula makes sure it at least incrementally goes up every two years, um, hopefully every year. It didn't do that in the last biennium's budget. Uh, it was, that statute was suspended um, by the governor and the legislature in the final uh, budget. In this budget process, the governor left, suspended it again for both years, and the legislature did keep it out, but they also enacted revenue sharing, which is Potato, potato, you do get money back a little more. Uh, it's not the way we want to see it done, but we, we are getting revenue to Hampton if and when uh, we come to some resolution on the budget. But, you know, if you talk to people who have followed this process for many years, usually if a, if a governor suspends it for one year, they don't do it for both, just for one year. And this is four straight years frozen um, as the revenue is increasing steadily every year. So something has to give, and it seems clear that it's, it's not a partisan thing. In fact, uh, you know, we've been stiffed by um, everyone for a long time. So <laughs> I was very encouraged by uh, Representative Edgar's bill and, and what that could do, because when you keep revenue local, when you collect it here and keep it here, it is not subjected to political forces and other counties and communities from uh, because obviously we are, uh, we have a lot of needs in this state that are unmet. We do have a revenue problem. Uh, it's clear that that's true because we, we rob Peter to pay Paul. We have four crises at the same time, um, leaving our rural towns to have tax rates, property tax rates, which are practically double ours. That's supposed to be the affordable places to live. So there's a direct relationship between state revenue and state aid direct relationship between state aid and property taxes. The less state aid you get, the higher your property taxes have to be. So um, I think we just have to be honest about making sure the state can find a way to provide more state aid. This budget did that to the tune of uh, over $100 million in education, which would have provided uh, a lot of state aid 
for those communities and lower property taxes. And you know, ultimately, what I'm going to be looking at now that I have the wherewithal with our uh, tax policies in the state and our processes, one thing we could do is uh, enact a simple reform to the meals and rooms tax filing process. When we ask how much did Hampton generate, they can safely say we don't know because we don't ask. Yeah. So let's ask. Uh, so let's include that in the way they file so it is broken down in enough detail yes. that we can then go back. And I know, uh, I know, Ms. Barnes, you, you've made efforts in the past to identify how much revenue we generate here. I want to know, too. And I think that would help us to make the case with our peers in the House and the Senate that is a legitimate gripe that we have. Um, perhaps a, a cleaner solution, but a harder one, is in the long run, what you see other states and communities do, and it makes sense, is you take what is meals and rooms tax revenue or equivalent, and you slice it into th two or three parts. There's the local part, the county part, the state part. And the local part stays local and never gets to the state. So you could do that without increasing meals and rooms tax. Yeah. You could keep it the same. Um, I don't know how heavy of a lift that would be, but ultimately that would be the cleanest possible solution. Um, in the meantime, uh, I'm going to look at the filing process and reforming that so that we can at least generate the data that we need to make the case. Because I think there is genuine uh, appreciation for our concern and our frustrations, but without the data, um, we're in a tough spot. So I think that's one of the next steps. And of course, anything we can do to improve the relationship between the state and the town and the services provided and where the revenue goes so that the burden and the revenue uh, go together, right? The state can't get all the revenue and stick us with the bill. Um, <laughs> because when that happens, and I was watching the most recent select board meeting, if they fail to pick up trash, <clears throat> we're burdened with the costs. That's an incentive to not do your job. Not to say they would do that, but there's a misalignment of you know, service levels, um, and we need to uh, find a better way to do that. And to the extent the legislature can do anything to help, uh, we're, we're ready to do that. So I look forward to mm -hmm. working with you all to find solutions to those problems. I just have to say that on the issue of just transparency on where the money gets, where the money is collected for meals and rooms, that's Nancy Stiles and I have a couple of bills in the past that we've attempted to do that. We and got killed. Tends to get outvoted. <clears throat> we don't want to have the uh, revelation on how much money is being collected in each community. I, I will say that the case to make for why it's necessary is that the first step in the budget process is ways and means develops projections for revenue. That's the top line in the budget. How much do you think we're going to take in? It tells you how much the state can spend. Yeah. So if we're doing that with nebulous, you know, rounded figures and we don't know what the gozintus are, we don't know where it was generated or what type of <coughs> tourism, um, mm. you know, led to those revenues, yeah. then we can't, with any, any certainty whatsoever, determine whether certain impacts in the, in the next year will affect the, you know, our ski tourism or perhaps beach tourism and, and make legitimate projections. So I think it's only responsible governance to have the data necessary to develop clear projections mm -hmm. and yeah. put forward sound budgets. Mm -hmm. And that will be, uh, that's the case we need to make because it's difficult to have a rebuttal for that. And State Rep. Jandron. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I got my here. We're actually. I'm gonna. I'm gonna say that I'm gonna follow along your vein. I represent three towns, and um, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna use arbitrary towns. I'm not gonna use the three that I represent. But you have town A, B, and C. A and B have great restaurants. A has great hotels. B has uh, lots of things that that get rooms and meals. But town C said uh, we're gonna put our zoning so strictly that we don't have any restaurants or hotels. We don't take any money in for the state for uh, room and meals tax. Mm. But A and B pay all that money into room and meals tax, but A, B, and C get a disbursement. So I think that we need to know where the money's coming from to know where it's going. Well, we know where it's going, but how much it came in, they don't know. So I, th I think well, you're right. It's totally unfair with it, the way they do it. Uh, you're, you're into a position where uh, Seabrook and Hampton uh, 
are probably donor towns when it comes to uh -huh. that, just like we are in the education field. So, uh, Senator Sherman talked about uh, some of the bills that he was very successful with, and I like the count. It was a great count. I introduced six bills this year. Um, of those, four became law. One is being retained in committee uh, because th there's a subject matter not related to my bill, but in the underlying law that they want to fix, and they want to use my bill as a vehicle to fix that. So I'm anticipating that will pass in the next year. Well, the sixth one was killed. Uh, I don't even remember what it was because it was so painful. <laughs> but uh, I, I co-sponsored, I sponsored or co-sponsored 18 bills, which is unheard of for a House member, I think. I don't know. You guys got in that many? It was busy, very busy. Um, uh, being in the legislature and the Judiciary Committee, I'm there three days a week on you, on, and I know, Rennie, you are too with the Criminal Justice Committee. So we're pretty busy. But that means leaving committee to go to a, uh, another committee to testify or, or answering phone calls or emails while you're sitting in committee. So a uh, very busy year for me. Uh, very happy to do that. Uh, one of the, the high points, and Rennie, worked with me on this uh, to a great deal, and as well as Senator Sherman, was the bill we did for Hampton Falls School, which was signed into law. Um, it was actually signed into law, what, two days after the students from Hampton Falls had graduated eighth grade, so mm -hmm. they've left a legacy for their school. A um, Couple of the other things, I did co-sponsor a bill, and I understand it has been signed. That was the bill about the Water Commission that had uh, expired. Yes. Uh, that is now, I believe that was signed into law. So that, that will be coming back. I think you <coughs> sat on that commission, is that correct? I Somebody sat on the, uh, on the long-term, it, it, it was a very long name, long-term yeah. objectives for uh, drinking water in the I state. I think that they reinstituted that because you had asked about it and we all co-sponsored it. I believe that's been signed into law. So that'll be coming nice. back. Keep an eye out for that. You might want to have an appointment for that. Uh, we've done a lot of things to try to protect our water. And it's really, like I said, out of the six bills to have four pass, it's huge, especially when I'm in a minority. But I had a lot of help, these guys here. <laughs> uh, you'll find that w when it comes to bills, you hear about partisanship and you hear about this party and that party. Well, the five of us, or actually six of us, because Mike is not here, um, talk a lot. We go to lunch, we say, hey, let's go have some lunch, let's talk about this issue, and we work together. Um, sometimes that puts me on the wrong side of the fence with my party, but I don't care, because <laughs> I don't represent my party, I represent the town, right? Um, so I think all of us have taken positions that are sometimes contrary to what we're being told we should vote, and I think we've done better for the town for that reason. So if you, any, any of you guys disagree with me, I, I'd, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, but it was really nice introducing the bill about the uh, jet skis and go, having to go to the committee and they are saying, hey, there's a problem here, and having Pat on, the, uh, on that committee say, hey, let's do a subcommittee and let's fix this. Yeah. Um, and normally a subcommittee will sit down and they will hash things out and not include a sponsor of that bill, but they included me in that conversation. So I, I was very thankful for that. I mean, we worked as a team, mm -hmm. and it, I think the end result was pretty, it was passed by a, a, a voice vote in the House, yep. Yep. Uh, and in the Senate, I think it was a voice vote as well, so. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Extremely, extremely lucky. Yeah. The ones that we got passed, we passed really well. The ones that got killed, got killed really bad, so. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. Yeah. Um, just, yes. One, one thing, one, one part that's really important for you and the public to understand, I think most of you understand it, is that um, we don't just do the legislating part, but we also, uh, I think there were almost uh, 70 commissions mm -hmm. um, that were created this session. Um, and so it's really helpful, and we should probably publish which commissions we're on. But for the Seacoast, um, I'm on, I'm vice chair of the Drinking Water Council, which is the one okay. that okay. takes care of the, or puts out the funding for, um, from the MTBE settlement. So that's, started out at over 250 million. And Chuck Morse, who uh, is the Republican leader in the House, um, former Senate president, has done an absolute spectacular job okay. of leveraging those funds. And 
we work very well together, chair and vice chair, to make sure that happens. I'm on a subcommittee that's meeting this mm -hmm. Thursday to look at all the new applications. But hopefully that will be the vehicle. As many of you know, the Attorney General is bringing suit against manufacturers of PFAS. I met with him three times mm. to urge him Dang. to do that. And uh, I'm not giving myself at all credit, but I think the pressure was helpful to get him to move forward with that suit, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, get enough revenue to be able to make sure that the taxpayers aren't bearing the brunt of PFAS. <coughs> um, the other commissions that are important are that we re, uh, reauthorized the environmentally triggered um, illness. Um, that was <clears throat> one that Representative Mesmer and I were working on, um, and that's looking at the link between health and the environment. Um, I'm also on the Coastal Hazards Commission, um, uh, and Fred Rice had a lot to do with the orig origins of that commission, uh, and Nancy Stiles as well, and I believe she served on it on the Senate side. And um, so there are many commissions out there that we are working on, including the one that Representative Cushing re uh, referenced. Um, and what we could probably do is get a list of those to you so that you know yeah. where you could go for that assistance. Do you all want to share that right now while the public might hear? Do you, well, do you want to share yours? Well, um, well, my understanding of the process is those are uh, the, right. the the newly created commissions and committees right. will be determined. The the yeah, uh, right. membership will be determined over the course of the oh. summer, and we're in the process oh, of that. I mean, there are some uh, existing now. ones. You know, Tom mentioned the Coastal Risk and Hazards Commission. Jason and I are both on it. Yeah, in right. addition to Tom, right. um, I'm on the organization, the Interbranch Criminal and Juvenile Justice. Council. Um, I also had a bill that <clears throat> passed that would uh, establish a study committee to um, that was actually going to. It was supposed to just make sure that the committee hearings and, and and committee subcommittee votes were recorded and available on the internet. Yeah. It didn't quite get that far, so instead they appointed a commission to come up with the recommendations to make it happen. I think it's a really simple thing to do, but. Um, I, I, and I'll be that bill passed. The governor signed it. I'm going to be on that that committee. Um, mm -hmm. this I, I just wanted to mention one that also came out of the committee that I'm on: resources, recreation, and development. That I think will be important. It's a committee. Um, it, it is to look at unprotected mm -hmm. water, drinking water mm -hmm. sources throughout the state. Mm -hmm. um, it, to look at, at at what those are. And, and potentially what the cost would be to protect those so that, that we avoid the situations that we're finding ourselves in now because mm -hmm. if we can look at those drinking water sources now. So uh, that is <coughs> one that came out of, and I, I put my name in to serve on that committee. So um, we'll see where that one goes. Anyone else so. want to share theirs? Well, I just want, I will, Mike Edgar's not here, so I'll share it to Mike. Mike's on the capital budget. Oversight Committee, which is a committee that takes a look at what, all the money that goes out for all the capital budgets and makes sure that everything is done according to the wishes of the legislature. And I think the last note would be um, the House members actually serve also in a role <laughs> at the county, and uh, each one of us right. is on a subcommittee of that. Um, Mike Edgar and myself are actually on the executive committee of the county. So if you have a county issue or a county problem, call on us and we can help you with that. Okay. Uh, questions for our guests. Mrs. Wolseley, comments? Um, Jason, you were a very gracious host uh, when we went down to uh, Seabrook uh, to uh, look at the bridge stuff and all the other good things. And I appreciated that very much. And I'd be happy for another information, another invitation to go down. <laughs> you, you're, you guys are very, very nice to uh, host. Um, Tom and Dr. Sherman, opioids. Um, one thing uh, that we have done in Hampton, the police department has a um, uh, place where you can dump excess medications instead of keeping them in the house. Mm -hmm. If you have medications that cause problems, you can go down to the police station and drop the stuff off. Um, it would be nice if every community perhaps did something like that. Uh, just get it out of the households. Um, and then, Dr. Sherman, uh, 
I was looking, I've got my legislative bulletin, but I don't remember everything you guys have done, but it has an age for tobacco purchases, House Bill 2. Um, not just tobacco, but this vaping garbage. And when people are on the beach, bad enough if individuals are smoking, but if they're having this vaping stuff there, you're going to be breathing in that? Whoop. Uh, that, yeah. We, we're going to make him all, we're going to make him all official. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Uh, has any attention been paid to this vaping yes. nonsense up there? Yeah. Yeah. And, and limit the ages to purchase and don't, don't uh, smoke it in public or whatever? Well, you know, one of the, one of the things, one of the aspects of that is um, taxation, right? That was a, a critical component with um, curbing tobacco usage and, you know, as tobacco usage is on the, the slow but steady decline and vaping is a sharp, sharp increase. Yes. And many of the devices have uh, a significant amount of nicotine in them and yep. it's used by a lot of teenagers developing sort mm -hmm. of some dependency there. So there are some uh, health concerns. Um, the taxation related to vaping was retained so that we can work through uh, all of the nuance <coughs> associated with that. It's something we want to get right. Um, but that is a bill that will be worked on um, in the coming months, and you'll hear more about. Because it should be a pretty big concern in the so communities. Nat national studies have shown that the single biggest corollary to preventing teen smoking is cost. And so as you increase the tax, yeah. the teen smoking actually goes down. The legislature back in 2011, I believe it was, passed a bill that actually cut our tobacco tax by 10 cents. And that had a sunset attached to it if it didn't achieve its revenue goal. So mm -hmm. the idea was to cut the tobacco tax, and that would spur revenue, especially along the border, where it makes it more uh, competitive. And actually what ended up happening was wholesale and retail just increased it by that 10 cents. <laughs> and so it didn't meet its revenue targets. Um, we lose, for each 10 cents of tobacco tax, we lose, I believe it's $10 million in revenue for the state. Uh, or we gain, depending on which way you do it. Mm -hmm. And so that the, uh, so not only has it been shown that the taxation, uh, uh, and, you know, it's called a sin tax, so yeah. the taxation on tobacco uh, is preventive, especially for teens. Um, cutting the taxes did not have the, uh, did not have the benefit of increasing revenue. And for all of us, um, in the state, the cost to the state, the estimated cost, is in the multiple billions of dollars annually mm -hmm. from the cost of tobacco, uh, tobacco use, and all the health ramifications. So, uh, and if you talk to any school administrator across the state right now, vaping is one of the top concerns they have because it is out of control. Along with that, they're going to they're going to look at. It. They had uh, sort of regulators in there that regulate the tobacco. Um, sales in the state and they said they they don't even have any idea how many uh, vendors there are in the state they pop up almost overnight yeah. they're in stores you wouldn't expect them to be and so vendor licensures or visibility is going to be a component of that but are there any stipulations statewide in the state parks that that vaping stuff and and even smoking are not uh, not to be in there and have enforcement of that do we I have would, it? I would, I'd have the, to check with Director well, Price. Well, actually, the out. legislation was passed to give, actually, I don't know if it made it through the Senate. It did. It made, yeah, legislation was passed that gives the authority to the Director of Parks to, to restrict, not limit, but to restrict um, smoking. Right. But whether or not they have actually... I don't know how they will go about it right. remains to be seen, but <laughs> prior to that, there was no authority. And I think part of it was in part response to, well, certainly, Hamps's decision that it was did not want to see mm. proliferation of smoking on our 
municipal beaches prompted the an awareness on the part of the state parks that perhaps they might want to yeah. take a look at that. If, if Especially with the children up, and the families. If yeah. I could follow up on that a bit too, um, if you didn't know, I, I used to serve on the planning board in the town of Seabrook. I was actually chairman for three years out of my nine-year stint. And we had, I want to say, four different uh, people came into the town of Seabrook and said, we want to open a vape shop. That's our primary business. That's all we're going to sell. And one of the things that the planning board did was on the site plan uh, stipulations or conditions of the site plan approval said that no person under the age of 18 shall purchase your product. If they do, you'll lose your occupancy or whatever the case is. We go to code enforcement. But, I mean, I think the towns have the ability in that way to, to do that under the uh, land use regulations. Um, but you're 100% correct. Let's say... I have, I'm not going to pick on anybody, um, I have uh, convenience store XYZ, that's the name of my company, and I sell cigarettes and beer, and tomorrow I want to sell vape. There's no way the state knows I'm selling a vape at all. There's no licensing, licensure structure uh, for vape products at all. Jason, even if you limit, if, if, you, if you put a floor of the age 18 to buy that junk, they can buy it and then give it to the younger kids. This is, this is a big problem. Um, I have two more quick things for you. Uh, last year when I came back on the board, um, I was really excited about budgets and stuff. And I remember picking up a copy of the Concord Monitor, and that issue had the state, I think it was something like $5 billion that the state had taken in in revenue. So if you can't find out in Concord, call up the Concord Monitor <laughs> and they'll be able to get you. And my very last thing for you, and I think this is critical, this joint operations plan and these state parks, I'm telling you, Hampton and the citizens of Hampton are being taken to the cleaners the volume of trash, trash, at the Hampton Beach State Park, it is my understanding, I will stand corrected if necessary, but it's my understanding that every other state park in New Hampshire has roll-offs and they hire private contractors to get rid of the waste. Now, probably no other state park has the volume of waste that we have, but this is a terrible burden on the taxpayers our deputy uh, public works director is sitting in the back row. Jen is back there. This is a terrible burden on our public works department. And no one, including Mr. Bryce and his associates, no one will listen. And in addition, we should have state police. I believe the Hampton Police Department was instrumental several years back in kind of kicking the state troopers off the Hampton uh, State Park. We should have state police officers in the Hampton uh, State Park. Uh, the neglect, and I would say neglect, they won't even come down from Concord and sit down and talk with us. They won't even sit here on Channel 22 and have a discussion and a little negotiation with the Board of Selectmen. But the problem with the Hampton Beach State Park, I think, is terrible. The town derives no revenue, to the best of my understanding, no revenue from that state park. And there's a lot of money that goes through that, st that state park. And I consider a, that a terrible problem. And I'm furious about the um, burden that it pl is placed on this community. Thank you. Mrs. And thank Mrs. all of you for what you do. And Ms. Barnes. Yes, thank you for all you do, and thank you for all coming tonight. It's uh, truly appreciated. Um, I'm, I'm going to leave my state beach operations till the end. Congratulations on the uh, PFAS, mm -hmm. the conservative yeah. levels. My only concern is that the lawsuits that the state <clears throat> is pursuing against these polluters are never going to happen in time, and that it is going to be yeah. on the taxpayers. Yeah. So if you could do anything to prevent that from happening because I know with PFAS the water is a concern and Coakley is a concern but it is everywhere yeah. Yeah. so I mean we really need to look at it on a more global global level if you ask me but it's yeah. I'm glad to see New Hampshire does have the conservative one, level, one level of the things set. That was, one of the good things about it is that they've actually the state has retained Rod Ballot who was the kind of the, the, the foremost expert 
in the country. Um, he's the one that took on the big PFAS manufacturers um, in <coughs> West Virginia. Um, and I think while it may be a while before we get it, that's not a reason why we shouldn't be cleaning it up right away. Yeah. So. And one, oh. other, one other on the timing is if you are um, bringing suit on an issue of human health, it's much harder to prove than environmental contamination. And we have a ton of environmental contamination. And that's what Minnesota did. Their suit was moved much swifter than many of the other suits that we're trying to do the human health based. Uh, so uh, the team that they've got is, that the state has um, really has actually uh, contracted with, as well as their, they have asked for, and the legislature has given them $6 million mm -hmm. to jumpstart the process. One of, the, one of the things about these PFAS levels, really quickly, is that if you don't have fully protected PFAS levels, then you can't do an estimate of how much it will cost to remediate. Yeah. So if your levels are up at 70, like the EPA, the cost to bring all the municipalities to a level that protects human health is going to be much less than if your if your PFAS levels are based on science and are truly yeah. protective. So it's almost like if you were trying to do lead the cost of lead remediation and said, well, we're going to go with a much higher level. The cost to bring it down to where it really needs to be, we won't know. Yeah. So when we're trying to figure out how much is the taxpayer really, how much is that liability, it needs to be based on really good science, and that's why these levels are so critical, because it will give us the appropriate estimate of how much it's going to cost to get our state into compliance. Mm. The other concern I have, and it's not with Aquarian, because I follow that quite heavily, and I'm, like you said, they will still be compliant, right. even with these, ex these new regulations, but other landfills, municipal landfills, yeah. that okay. is going to obviously have to be paid up by, paid by the municipalities to clean that up. So that's going to, you know, come from the taxpayer, which most everything does. <laughs> but I just, you know, hope that you guys are well aware that this stuff is everywhere and it's probably in every landfill in the state. Yeah. Um, the other thing I have is we actually, I don't know whether he knew you guys were coming or not, but we received a letter from the governor last week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I've read it. Yeah, and he's... He's saying the reason why he uh, vetoed the budget was not because he disagreed with the programs contained with it, but because it contained a 93.4 million structural deficit for right. fiscal year 2021. And I think he's talking financial sustainability in here, which is long, you know, long term. That's very important as well. So, did you say both you and Representative Edgar were on the capital budget? No. Mike's on the capital budget, but that's separate than the operating budget. So, so the budget, yep. so the, the governor is, um, the 93, there is a line item, if you look at the budget, which is created by um, the, what is the initials for the group? Leg, what, the legislative budget. budget. Right, the LBO. The, there, is a, there is actually not a deficit. Um, the concern was, if you have a surplus and you spent, use surplus dollars, on ongoing projects, then you are going into a structural deficit. The budget, as it came out of the legislature, is actually the one-time spend is $110 million. So if you think of the math of that, <coughs> uh, if the surplus is around $90, $93 million that can go into the budget, and your one-time spend is $110 million, then you actually have a structural um, excess. You're not in a structural deficit. <coughs> and so what the budget does is it puts $5 million, a little over $5 million into the rainy day fund, making it the most robust rainy day fund in the history of New Hampshire. <coughs> and it also puts another $20 million into the education trust fund. So it ends with a positive at the end of the biennium. Uh, so it is not a structural deficit. It, it's it, you, you can't take one line item that's $93 million uh, and say that represents a deficit. If 
you look at the entire budget, <laughs> the entirety of the budget, and uh, my understanding is that legis legislative leadership is going to send you a response letter that goes into this in much more detail. Okay, good. Um, but the, the, the fundamental issue really comes down to that whether we suspend, you know, we've suspended the money that comes back to Hampton through rooms and meals. We've suspended a lot of taxes to the detriment of the towns. Yes. Um, and so we've seen this all the way through, all 11 towns. We've seen um, downshifting of cost to property taxes. What this budget does is it says we can no longer do that, and the only way we can afford not to do that is to actually suspend that final business tax cut. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't go back up. Nothing's going up. Um, and in fact, one of the things they're talking about is possibly if a company has made an estimated tax payment in March and April, you know, the, the first quarter, if they've already done that and the budget passes, hold them. Make, make them hold. Um, and then it is clearly not a tax increase. You know, all of this gets down to semantics, but the fundamental issue is how do we afford to address all the most significant issues in the state without increasing property taxes? Uh, and that's what the legislature feels their budget does. It doesn't, there's no capital gains tax, there's no family leave. There's been a lot that's been pulled out of the, at least the Democratic agenda has been put on the side uh, because the governor said he would veto it with those in it. Those have been taken out of it. Mm -hmm. But the fundamental that's left is you can't do it if you continue to give for the tax cuts. But there is no structural deficit as long as it's funded. Like I mean, Gina, the stuff with the capital budget, it's, that's you know, that's like a bond issue. That's the stuff that gets paid for by bond. There's some things in the operating budget that normally I think would be capital budget items like the, the hospital, but the, the, the bonded, the stuff that we go into debt with that builds highways, that builds okay. stuff is... I'm going to respectfully case. disagree with Tom Sherman. I think the problem is that the uh, state is, should maybe leave us alone a little bit more. I want to uh, go into some state operations issues that I've noticed living my whole life here and going down to that beach, what used to happen, what now doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, all as I know is when you propose something that is showing as a deficit, it's not good. It's not good for the taxpayer. It will never be good for the taxpayer. Adding programs when you're saying the only revenue is property tax, where's the money going to come from? Cut. I believe cut tax cuts work. I believe working in a small business in Hampton that since we've had the tax cuts, my the small business I work at is much busier. So are all the all the small businesses in Hampton, even though they maybe not have, they maybe do not get that tax cut, they are seeing the effects of the tax cuts that have happened on the national basis. But I'm not going to get into that right now. Um, every time someone complains about the lack of the support from the state, they always tell me, "We'll talk to your legislators." So I've documented everything I have for you guys because you all, all but one of you are here, and hopefully you can help Hampton with some of this. Um, one, I'm happy to see that the Department of, Inter Devi uh, Department of Environmental Services actually put up signs stating that there is ongoing fecal contamination tested from uh, Memorial Day through mm -hmm. Labor Day, and that's actually posted everywhere, which is really nice because I do happen to go onto the website and check mm -hmm. every once in a while, but I go in the ocean a lot, and I know <coughs> a lot of people do. So it's nice to know that, and it shows where you can go and check out the information. So that was I was very glad to see that. Um, also, we also enjoyed the presence of the state troopers and the Rockingham County Sheriffs over the 4th of July weekend. I know it was up all over Facebook. Great to see. I know everyone works well together down there, but the problem is it's not just 4th of July weekend that we need the support. The problem is the state troopers used to be there all the time, yeah. whether it was a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Yeah. Even if it wasn't great weather, they were there. They were part of the community. It was Hampton police and it was the state troopers. I'm not sure why they're not there anymore. All I know is when I go to other parts of the state and there's any type of activity going on, 
they are there. Um, they do have other municipalities there as well, but not, not too often, and I'm talking bike week, you know, old Kingston days, all the things that are all over the state. The state troopers are always there. Well, it's pretty much an event every day in Hampton in the summertime. I mean, today I was down there about 10.30. Traffic was already pouring in. Our police department, I know they do a great job, but uh, 36 full-time officers, I think, that's a lot to cover down there um, when we don't have the support of the state troopers like we used to always have. We do not have any park ranges at Hampton Beach. I know you're talking about not letting people smoke, things like that. Well, who's going to enforce it? Someone complains, guess what? They're going to call HPD, something else that we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, why can't we have a state after the lifeguards leave? I know they do a great job during the day. They enforce the beach during the day. But when they leave, there's no one there. Yeah unless our police happen to get called out there or they see something. At night, that's pretty difficult. Um, again, state, state parks transfers an average of $1.5 million from Hampton from the parking meters on an annual basis. Sidewalks. Just last night, I was contacted by a Hampton Beach business owner. She informed me the two Hampton Beach visitors tripped on the west side sidewalk in front of the casino. Apparently, Hampton Public Works was notified to deal with the situation. If it is somehow the town of Hampton's responsibility to maintain what the state of New Hampshire operations cannot, then why will the state of New Hampshire not permit Hampton Beach property owners upgrading their properties to enhance their portion of west side sidewalks? I believe the town of Hampton is scheduled to take the maintenance over anyway at some point, per a board of selectmen motion I was opposed to. Crosswalks on 1A are unacceptable. Something must change. Yeah, that's right. There was a close call down at Patriot's Corner at the south end on Saturday night. A pedestrian almost hit by a speeding car. I saw the skid marks yesterday morning. Quite a liability if the car did not screech to a stop in time. Yeah. Has the state explored the possibility of either virtual sidewalk crosswalks? I know that um, one of the residents right. was uh, inquiring about that or about the flashing crosswalk signs that we have a couple of yeah. them in town. There's too many tourists to continue with the status quo of past practices in my view. We have the same issues from the bridge all the way up to High Street and it's unacceptable. Over the 4th of July weekend, Hampton Public Works added an additional three-man crew for the trash pickup. This is, into, this is to ensure that Hampton Beach is kept clean. Another expense completely burdened on the town of Hampton taxpayer. I applaud our Public Works Director and Deputy for their efforts on this. By the way, the Town of Hampton Public Waste Collection and Solid Waste Budgets are a combined total of $1.517 million. Yep. State Parks transfers an average of $1.5 million from Hampton alone from the parking meters on an annual basis. Seacoast Online, July 3rd. The State Campsite Lottery noted that the per-day charge for sewer and water hookup at the State Parks Campground is $50. The sore at the state park is hooked up to the Hamptons Wastewater Treatment Plant. Again, total support for the from the Town of Hampton taxpayer. The Town of Hampton has just bonded over $13 million to upgrade its wastewater treatment plant. In the Public Works Capital Improvement Plan for 2022, it is estimated that another $15 million will be necessary to appropriate. That's $28 million. State parks transfers an average of $1.5 million from Hampton alone from parking meters. Hampton Beach Parking leases, which I know Representative Bourgeois talked on, state leases to Hampton Beach property owners. They vary from $543 up to two, almost $2,500 a space. It must depend on the location, I suspect. So if you don't have a lease on this list, which we have the list right here, that means that you're supposed to just pay the normal hourly, right? These would be all the lease spots. That's all that have been leased by hotel owners at the at the beach. Is that what you're? Yeah. 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 Okay. That means and do you have any idea like why the prices are so different? Is it just? I I, I have heard that it it that at one point there were some zones. Um, in fact, I you know, Charlie. Charlie. In the past, Charlie. they've always told Charlie us Preston. that it was uh, the amount that is generated is the amount that they've kept track of in the past. Right. So when get. you see them lower, that's all those collected in the last year or the last time they kept track of it. Yeah. Oh, okay. And they keep track of it on a regular basis. So every spot is quite different. If you're yeah. right down at the main part of the beach, they're going to be much more. 
Yeah. That's what we've that's always been told in the past. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like the ones at Boar's Head are very, that, no, right. no one's ever you're, at them. You're not, yeah, there's so no beach there. It reflects so. exact use of yeah. those exact spots. And so those are pretty much all the complaints I have. Um, <laughs> and also that 1933 was 75 years ago, so mm -hmm. I'd say that it's uh, time to get serious for the Hampton taxpayer. Uh, if the, I know what your situation is, legislators, is 400 of you, and we're just Hampton, and no one wants to hear it. But I really think that we should consider some type of a deal where, obviously, we have to do all the maintenance down here. I can't see that ever changing. It's never going to change. So if that's to continue, then why can't we get something on an annual basis from the state of New Hampshire to do it? It's their property. Okay, yeah. let's have uh, Mr. Waddell. Okay. I'm just going to make statements. I don't want any responses. You guys can yeah, talk. Yeah, we'll ask for final responses after everyone talks. Yeah, you talks. guys can talk. Yeah. Um, we're getting, first of all, we're in we do have a lot of hand. crises. <laughs> but in most polls, New Hampshire comes out as one of the best states in the country. So let's mm -hmm. let's say that, too. That there's a lot of positive going on in New Hampshire besides all the negative. Mm -hmm. All right. On education funding, they just passed that sports betting. Isn't that $100 million that's going to go to education? So that's going to help that. Mm -hmm. That co-sponsored that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so that that's good. And and the thing is, um, you know, it, it's not, it's, people always go up there and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going <coughs> to, we'll do this bill, I'm going to do this bill, I'm going to do this bill. I think we got to get down to how am I going to get the bills passed. Mm -hmm. Because Rusty was up there, I was up there, a long time ago, there's a lot going on, a lot of people, and people all have been trying to get the rooms and meals changed and they've been unsuccessful. So not only... I'm going to give a new bill here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to find out where it's coming from. Everybody's tried that. How are you going to get it passed? You got to, de you know, you got to come down with some really strategy to get it done, because you know, Rennie, you know, every, all of you know, they just get looked at. And they they laugh at you. Not going to do it. Well, so, sometimes it's just playing defense to make yeah. sure they don't steal more from us. Right, but I mean, <laughs> it, it's got to be, it, it's got to be re reality based, you know. And on the on the budget, you know, I'm a little disappointed on the budget because there was a surplus, right? Was. Okay. There is a surplus, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And also the revenue, business revenue went up when that tax cut went into effect. I mean, that's a reality, right? So what you're doing is you're projecting that it's going to go down when that was exactly what they said the last time yeah. they were initially was put in that was good. I don't need any responses. I don't need any responses because we got other business we got to do. So that's just my statements. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Rusty? Yeah, I'll, first of all, thank you guys for coming. Uh, as you see and you've known for quite a while, we do have an issue with the state and, and how they fund things. And Hampton would always like to see more because we obviously do more. I hope you heard these people when they came up and talked about a... Uh, you know, they came here with it. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I mean, that, that's your bailiwork. That's a state beach. That's a state problem. So hopefully that you can uh, talk with uh, Phil Bryce and, and, and see if you can get something out of that or, or at least get some answers for them and, and do that. Um, I, for one, was down the beach this 4th of July. I saw a lot of good things going on down there. I did see park rangers down there. We had at least two or three of them in town. And they were doing fireworks. They were, I guess they were up on the North Beach part of it. Yeah, there were a lot of fireworks going on. Yeah, there were a lot of people down here. Um, you know, I continue to see uh, we don't have the state police presence that we used to have. However, they still are here on, on, on fireworks nights and weekends and stuff like that. And I, I continue to encourage them to come down more. But again, it's all budgetary stuff. So um, getting to that, um, I think things... As far as the beach, I think we're trying to work together with with this with the state. Uh, when I've gone down and talked to Meredith, and we've had a problem, she's she's been willing to listen and and, and uh, talk about it and see what we could do to get things straightened out. So yes, we do have a problem, and yes, I'd like to see that problem at some point resolved. But thank you for continue to work on it. Yeah. And I uh, would like to say um, <clears throat> this was a great night for you to come, and thank you so much for coming. Um, <coughs> we are all committed to working together, and I think that's what I liked about what Jason had to say. Uh, that is the real spirit of what is completely imperative here. We all must work together. We all realize that we've got the short end of the stick for many years from the state. Um, <laughs> 
and we were, I, and I think everyone else here realizes the state has a position too. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, I've seen a lot of positive things. I've actually seen a lot of um, state troopers. I think the main reason why I've been seeing them is because there was a lack of them before. So I think something has happened on that front, and I intend to ask the chief about it. I almost got a ticket for one that looked like it was parked waiting to give tickets <laughs> right down at the beginning of Ocean Boulevard. Um, so I was happy to see that one. Um, but uh, I think that it was very good. It's great that Susan and Gordon Witcher are here to, uh, to talk about that problem with that mm -hmm. stairwell there. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a problem that we had in the past that um, Mr. Welch did a lot for that really I don't think we had to do, but I, I know Mr. Welch paid attention to it and the state also paid attention and we all work together, which is so imperative and it's the most important thing that we can do. Um, anyone can make figures look like however they want. But there are, you know, the state, I also believe, has a problem with having enough workers, just like I've seen several businesses that aren't even open on certain days of the week. They've shortened their hours. Everyone has a problem with workers. That's something the state needs to address, too. And so I'm going to invite you all to have a limited, maybe a minute or so, for a closing comments, because we have business to do here this evening. Well, thank you, and thank you for having us here. Um, Part of what we do is passing bills, and part of what we do is working on commissions, and an awful lot of what we do is being here, being in district, and taking care of a lot of constituent issues that we try to. Uh, certainly on the, the working on between the, the town and the parks is a critical part of it, and as I've offered before, um, really trying to make sure some of these issues are addressed. I have been working with the Department of Transportation. I will call Victoria uh, Sheehan uh, tomorrow about the mm -hmm. issue of the ramp and also Phil Bryce. And because, it, because it's 1A and it's parks, it's not Hampton. <laughs> you know, this, is, this is a state issue, and I'll be talking to them tomorrow about it. But that's the kind of response that I think you need from us and that uh, we try to give. Uh, there are big issues, there are small issues, and um, I think this panel of legislators is trying to address all of them, uh, at least all the ones we know about, and certainly that's my goal. So thank you for this kind of interaction. It's been great. I listen to all of it. I listen to both the positive and the negative, and we, and we need to be responding to that. Thank you for coming this evening. Ms. Uh, Representative Bushwa. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. We appreciate the opportunity. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as has been said, um, you, you know, we have got to continue to, to work our relationship with the state. Um, and, and I have uh, I've, I've worked pretty consistently with, uh, with Director Bryce now, and, and yeah. he's, he's been responsive, and I'm trying to, uh, to continue that. Um, you know, it's you know, as you said, the, the state has their position, but but we've got to uh, we've got to to make our case and make it well. Um, so we're gonna just gonna continue that effort to work uh, to work directly with him because uh, I think that's the way we can get things done. Thank you. I just want to say thank you also to for the board for inviting us here, and I think we do our best to try to work in a collaborative fashion to yeah. do what's best for Hampton for the state. I just want to uh, note that. The filing period for legislation, at least for House members, opens up on September 8th. It's a two-week period. I know that any of us would be uh, eager to hear from anyone <laughs> from the town who has a concern that they'd like to bring before the legislature. The Senate has no rules when its bills can be introduced, but um, we do have a window. We are more flexible. We do have a window there, and I just want to encourage people to do that. I have some legislative initiatives that I think will be important to the town that I'm going to bring forward, and I just, again, thank you. Thank you, and please come back and talk to us about them in the future. Thank you for having me as well. I just wanted to address a couple points. Um, the first two weeks being a legislator, we got fiscal briefings, and part of that explained where the bump in business revenue came from. And it was, without a doubt, the major factor came from the federal tax reform, which led to a, a short-term repatriation 
of business profits, which were apportioned to states. And so that bump we got, uh, at least the biggest contributor to it, was a temporary and winding down uh, bump of offshore profits coming back. That window will close. That yeah. will cease to continue. Yeah. As for our current rate of business taxes, where it is now, it's come down twice. Where, it, where it's being held now for the purpose of this budget that was proposed, it's the most competitive of our adjacent states at 7.9 percent. It's the lowest. It's lower than Vermont, Maine, Massachusetts. Mm. Uh, so where we get more competitive now to grow business and attract business is a workforce, which we are sorely needing, and it's trending in the wrong direction. So. Uh, investments in education do two things for us. Uh, they attract working families and they offset uh, property taxes. When you make those investments in state aid to municipalities, you're putting less burden on the taxpayer and it's more affordable housing. So I think we're on the same page in wanting to grow and attract businesses and I, I think, you know, uh, I'm just going about it the most objective way I know how. So, yeah, you. it's trended that way for 40 years. Yeah. <laughs> um, Mr. Chandra? I must, I must be reading from a different book. Um, <laughs> uh, I did want to highlight, and I should have said this earlier, uh, Senator Sherman and I co-sponsored a bill, Senate Bill 127, which uh, the, would put Hampton District Court back in Hampton. Uh, in the House, we amended the bill uh, in my committee. I actually, I offered the amendment. The amendment was that the family court for the Hampton District will be in Hampton. Yeah. So if you have a family issue, you don't have to go to Portsmouth anymore. We just so that's going to be effective June, June, July 26th of uh, next year. Yeah. So um, I hope that the chief of police is, is thankful that it's back in Hampton, one. And two, <laughs> any family issue will be heard in Hampton, so you don't have to drive all the way to Portsmouth. Great. And that's helpful, especially for us in Seabrook, to have to drive so far. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have Chairman. Nancy Stiles to thank. For, I she worked very hard on that. Just based on what, what Representative Bushway said about uh, talking with Commissioner Bryce, uh -huh. could you please ask him if uh, state parks would still be operating as a with a deficit if they didn't have the 1.5 uh, Hampton transfer every year? You know what's interesting? It's interesting because you go back to 33. It's interesting that the deal in 1933 was that the town would keep the parking spaces and the parking revenue and the state would spend money to build the seawall and right. use funds from the from the gas tax to maintain the seawall and now 75 years later the state's taking the money from the parking uh, spaces and using it to pay for the seawall and not spending the money it said it was going to do on that. And that's, I know that was part of the litigation. It never got resolved, but that's just, that's, that's just the historic fact that we can't ignore. Well, thank you very much for coming this evening. We've got all the thank town you. employees back here waiting, probably being paid. Um, Jason, come back anytime. Thank you so much. And we'll all continue to work together. Next, we have Stephen Falzon. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Q2 review for the trust funds. Uh, take a quick overlook at the uh, markets in general. Please, no uh, talking. Guys. Yeah, please. Uh, markets had a good second quarter. The S&P was up 4.2% in the second quarter. It's up 18.2 year to date. Uh, bonds have been positive. All market caps have had a pretty decent uh, had a pretty decent second quarter. Uh, quick look at the, the fund in general. The fund ended the quarter at 22,354.53. Uh, had an investment game of five, investment game of five sixty nine, eighteen, and paid out to the town one hundred and ninety eight thousand dollars over the first three months. Um, start of the third quarter has been a little bumpy, but you know things seem to be trending in the in the right direction. All the funds had a really good yeah. Q two. Uh, just a quick look at. Um, 
the, the trade war seems to no longer be a big headline. Markets seem to be reacting pretty good to that. Uh, bonds had good returns so far. Uh, Bearing Point provides us with an income projection that uh, money will be spun off to the town. And the latest projection in our meeting today was somewhere between eight and nine hundred thousand dollars for the year mm -hmm. should be spun off to the town. And that is pretty much all I have. Thank you. Maybe, maybe we could send the trustees to Concord and make con <laughs> run. No, thank you. Did you have any comment, <laughs> Mrs. Wilson? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Good job. Awesome job. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Yeah, good job. You guys have diversified. You're, you're right yeah, there. Exactly. The you're right on top of the market. What's happening? Yeah, David yeah. has structured the portfolio very well. Yeah, you guys have done a good job. He's done a good job. Super. Yeah. No questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. See what happens when it's a good result. Very few questions. Next quarter could be totally different. Thank you. Um, next, we have Renee Boudreau, Recreation Parks Director. Good evening. Um, we have lots going on. I'm just going to kind of highlight some of the important factors that I think uh, you guys want to be aware of. Um, we're on week four of eight for our summer camp. Uh, we have sold out every week um, for the summer, so that's off to a great start. We have awesome staff. Um, we also have been selling out all of our senior programs. <coughs> We've got all things from overnight trips to day trips to New York, and anything in between. Wednesday, we're going to Plymouth to go see Michael Miner. So it's just a day trip in the rec bus, good pricing, um, and a little bit of something for everybody in that. As far as some of the projects we have going on, uh, Eaton Park Fencing was a 2018 project that was supposed to get done due to the weather conditions out in Eaton Park. That's been delayed until this summer, um, and the weather this spring hasn't helped us either, so the trucks have not been able to get out there. Mm -hmm. They tried once, and they sunk up to their axles, had yeah. to get towed out. So that's still on hold. They were talking about starting that this week, uh, weather permitting, of course. Uh, Kids Kingdom update. I just got some news across my desk this afternoon from Jen, so I'm going to let her touch base on that in a little bit. Um, and also, as far as playgrounds go, right across the street from the library, we recently had Public Works remove three pieces of equipment. Uh, two of them were in disrepair, and one of them was very illegally placed. Uh, safety was an issue there, so I had them pull out the two broken ones and remove the swing set, which was not um, up to specs as far as where it was placed. Um, as far as some programs we've got going on, we're working with the USS Han uh, Virginia, I'm sorry. June 1st, we had a park cleanup down at the skate park. We had eight sailors work for three or four hours, um, <laughs> and very limited in what we can give them for tools to use, so they did very hands-on uh, removal of a bunch of invasive weeds and trees and stuff like that that they could get out without having chainsaws and uh, any big heavy equipment, so oh, they, they put their work in on that day. Also on June 10th, uh, the committee went to the change of command up at the shipyard, and that was a very um, eye-opening experience. It was very well done, and it was an impressive ceremony. So I think everybody enjoyed that. Um, we have a UNH, uh, excuse me, a UNH needs assessment coming up. We're starting our first meeting on July 31st, and that's going to start probably five or six following meetings. Um, where they're going to come evaluate our facilities, our staff, our programs, what we offer, what we could offer, what we need in town. And we're going to have a bunch of forums where we have different select groups in town come and give their impression of what we are lacking and what we're good at and what we can show improvement for and what the town would need going forward. Mm. Um, Last Wednesday, I was able to connect with Planet Fitness. They came with 25 uh, volunteer staff for three hours. So a total of 75 hours of volunteer work where they were down at Tuckfield. And if you didn't know that, I just told you that, you wouldn't know that they actually were able to remove anything. There's so much overgrowth that they pulled out. Um, it doesn't really look like they put that much effort into it, but they were hot, they were sweaty, and they put some effort into that park. So I greatly appreciate uh, Planet Fitness and their staff for their volunteer work there. Um, 
and that had been postponed twice due to weather also. So that was supposed to be a May job that turned into mid-July. Um, Eaton Park outfield fence, I met with uh, Ray Ann in conservation and went over a couple of issues we have out there. It's very wet, um, but we also have our outfield fence, which was getting inundated with pricker bushes and mm -hmm. poison ivy and yeah. every kind of weed and tree starting to grow through there. So I talked to her about options and what we can do to try to prevent that and uh, help the safety of the people out there using it. Um, and they talked and they agreed that we could push back a certain distance behind the fence as far around as we could get where it was not soaking wet and um, maintain that to the best of our ability which hasn't been done in a while and going forward might be a little tricky just because of the uh, conditions of the, the ground out there. Um, our flag football program just started. We've got 80 people signed up so far so that's going to be a big one for the fall. We usually have 250 people uh, kids on the field from grades 3 through 12 uh, every Saturday starting end of August through mid-November. And then uh, also a couple of side notes. I have a group of three kids that are very active with the skate park. Um, they volunteered last summer, the summer before that. They're volunteering to build stuff that we can't build uh, for them. They come in with ideas. They talk to me about you know how much quick creep they need and you know how they're going to design it and what they need to do. And they fill out our regular volunteer form and they put the sweat equity into it. Mm -hmm. um, I usually let the police know when they're going to be down there just so they don't get you know scared with a bunch of kids down there with tools trying to make some improvements to the park. So I just wanted to shout them out and give them some credit for the work they do down there. Um, and other than that, last week we had a strawberry festival with the fire department uh, over at the Victoria Inn. And we also had Channel 22 come and videotape that uh, just to give people a little idea of what else you know we offer in town. Um, firefighters put all the effort into the food. We purchased the entertainment form and Channel 22 just took footage, which Channel 22 has offered up that they have the ability to do videos for us and commercials and stuff like that. So we've used them to do a quick PSA for the uh, Kids Kingdom project that was on delay. And I also have worked with them uh, kind of doing a publicity thing for the department to show the variety of activities we are offering um, besides just doing kids programs and senior programs and you know what's offered at the park and all that kind of stuff. And then next we had a request from Smiles by the Sea for a donation. They came to us asking what they could do to help in town um, and we offer a, it's this year it's the F3 series it used to be years in the past Arts in the Park um, where we'd offer a program every Friday and at the park for free for the community and what we did this year is we toned it back a little bit and we only offered four instead of eight and we upped the quality of the performance a little bit so those got a little costlier in order to offer a better product um, and they came to us and said we'd be willing to help out with those programs for you. And they also wanted to help with our summer camp t-shirt costs. So they offered up uh, the donation for $17.50 for those programs. So that was the other thing. Thank you. Qu questions for uh, the director, Mrs. Wolsey? Yes, um, Fred, I discussed a donation, a potential donation um, from Parks and Rec with you the other day. What was your conclusion? It's part of the regular program. It's been going on for several years. Well, it's a, the fire dance thing has only, this is only the second year, but is it appropriate to donate? Because it's in their budget, yes. To the precinct, and that is part of the budget. It's to a governmental function. Okay. Oh, well, I just wanted to make sure that yeah. we're on the same page. Your position is not a union position, Renee, no. correct? How long have you worked for Hampton? This is my 19th year in May, I believe. 19 years. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, this is on his update from tonight. Well, I just have a couple of questions well, on, we're talking on, his on the, uh, yes, this on the recreation department. Tonight, and report. And I believe that the public needs to uh, have an understanding. Well, this is on I went tonight's back, report that we're talking. I went back. If you'd back, like to bring it up at another time, you're more than welcome. Any other comments for tonight's report? 
Well, if we will go back to meeting every you, Monday Mrs. evening, Mrs. Wolseley, you can talk under open. And if you will and let so us make, like. if you will let us put Did things you want to on the on agenda. This? Do you want to comment? I want on to this comment on the position. Okay, we're, Mrs. Uh, Regina, do you have anything to say? Yes, I do. Thank you for the report. And have we always done the maintenance over at the li the playground across from the library? For years, that was. It was called the Rotary Park. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know the agreement when it was officially established like that, but we have um, dropped the playground surfacing materials and stuff like that in the past. And then I recently asked them about updates and they about fixing stuff, and they did not want to continue it, so they gave it back to us. Oh, okay. And um, on the and thank you for your response the other day. I just happened to be downtown and that got brought up oh. about the flowers out by the gazebo. So that's honestly that's one of those projects with we have two 28 hour part time park staff and you know we've got money from Experience Hampton and it's just a matter of timing with the park staff to be able to do this stuff where I'm having issues. Like today I was unloading compost with a one ton truck because I don't have park staff to do it. They're out of hours. Is it your staff that also does the um, walkway that was built by Experience Hampton downtown? We have not had anything to do with that walkway, I don't believe. Okay, because I got, I don't, do you know who does? Because a business owner gave me these pictures about how it needs to be maintained. Hmm. Hmm. We'll take a look at it. Okay. We'll take it under advisement. Anything else about tonight? No, thank you. Okay, Mr. Waddell. Good job, Renee. You do a good job down there. Mm -hmm. the you do. Um, and you showed me the catalog of the prices of various equipment for the for the, uh, the playgrounds, which are outrageous prices. I mean, so it's really difficult to to replace things and keep things going. But you, you're doing a good job with the staff you have. You have, like you said, two part-time staff, and they're trying to maintain fields that can be played all year, all year. Right. plus the other stuff. You're doing well. I appreciate it. No, good job. I was at the uh, Strawberry Fest the other day. He stopped in to say hi. And uh, as, as usual, that event's gone on now 25 years probably. How was the shortcake? It was good. It was That's good. That's why you stopped in. That's right. Uh, but it's uh, it's always a good event, and, and our seniors always enjoy that. I mean, I, I got there at 11.30, and they were showing up then for 1 o'clock, as they typically do. Uh, but that's okay, and uh, they were having fun and enjoying it. And uh, uh, I'm glad to hear that, you know, we'll get those shrubs in that that uh, Experience Hampton is, is giving you the money for. Definitely. Thank you for your report. Thank you for coming in tonight and being Chairman, patient. You need a motion to accept the $1,750. Yes. Uh, so moved. Second. All those in favor, unanimous. Thank you Thank again. You. Next, we have uh, Chief Sawyer for the Police Department Department update. And Deputy Hobbs. Good evening. Good evening. I hope you've all received the uh, copy. There was a, an mm -hmm. update if you got the you. Uh, couple of Scribner's errors in there, so I want to make sure I got those corrected for you. Current full time staffing, we are authorized to have 36 sworn, and we are at our full complement this time. We uh, just finished up as, uh, remember, we had a swearing in the last meeting. Of our, pardon me, two meetings ago of our uh, newest officer, so that gets us up to the 36. At the Marchtown meeting, SAU 90 sponsored a warrant article to fund an additional school resource officer. The warrant article passed, increasing our full time staffing level from 35 to 36. In May, Officer Brandon Whitehead was selected as SRO Detective. SRO Detective Whitehead has been assigned to the Marston School, filling the newly created position. SRO Detective DeMarco remains assigned to the Hampton Academy, and SRO Detective Shannon Feely is assigned to the Center School. On April 22nd, Special Pie Time Officer Anthony Schreiber was appointed as a full-time officer and will attend the 180th New Hampshire Police Academy commencing in September. Officer Zachary Terranzoni began the 179th New Hampshire Police Academy in May and will be graduating on August 23rd. Upon graduation, Officer Terranzoni will return to the Patrol Division to complete a field training program. On June 1st, Lieutenant Gidley, a 31-year veteran of the Hampton Police Department, retired. Dan worked his way through the ranks, starting as a special part-time officer in 1988. Throughout his career, Dan has excelled in a variety of critical assignments 
to include motorcycle instructor, special response team, short team leader for crisis negotiators, accident reconstruction team leader, and assignment to the DEA for Operation Beachhead, which led to the dismantling of a major cocaine distribution ring operating in southern New Hampshire, Massachusetts. In addition to these assignments, Dan has been an intricate part of the leadership team for over 18 years. Dan will remain with the department as a part-time officer. On June 3rd, Special Part-Time Officer Kevin Smith was appointed as a full-time officer and will also attend the 180th Nature Police Academy in September. On June 14th, we began our summer season. Each summer, the department appoints corporals to meet the increased need for supervision. Officer Jason Jackson and Officer Christopher Kaiser were selected to serve as corporals. The corporals serve as direct supervisors to our part-time special officers during our busiest times at the beach. Our current part-time staffing level uh, stands at 32. We are authorized up to 70, but we are at a, a very low level at this time. We currently have 30 32 part-time officers in our roster. Three part-time officers are currently on a leave of absence. Absence bring the number of working part-time officers to 29. The department brought on seven new special uh, part-time officers this summer. Uh, of the working part-time officers, 14 are on probationary status with less than two years of experience to the department. The department reconducted testing for part-time officer applicants on Saturday, April 13th. There were 46 applicants scheduled to take the test. There were seven no-shows, four withdrawals. This left 31 applicants taking the written test with 25 scoring a passing grade and moving on to the physical agility testing. After the physical agility test, there were 17 applicants scheduled for oral board interviews. At the conclusion of the oral boards, 11 were given conditional offers of employment and began the next phase of hiring process, which included a thorough background investigation, polygraph examination, and psychological evaluation. After this extensive process, the department has enrolled four recruits for the 278th New Hampshire Part-Time Officer Academy beginning in August of this year. The department's next part-time officer testing process will be conducted on October 5th, 2019. Anyone interested in employment with the Hampton Police Department should visit our website, hamptonpd.com, and file an application electronically. The testing process will be for the placement in the Part-Time Officer Academy beginning in February of 2020. Department Operations. <coughs> Ongoing issues with heroin have plagued the region. Hampton has two overdose two overdose deaths attributed to opiates in the first half of 2019. We continue to work with our local, state, and federal partners to combat the issue. Our preseason activity, uh, beach activity started out slow to the wet and cool weather experienced in the region. Our officers did an outstanding job maintaining order during those hot, busy days when large crowds descend upon Hampton Beach. We have continued the program of bringing an experienced officers from other municipalities to augment our staffing levels. This has been proven to be very helpful in maintaining order and providing for good traffic throw through the beach area. Special thanks to the New Hampshire State Police, University of New Hampshire Police Department, Epping Police Department, who all provided personnel and equipment to assist with the preseason. The department continues its operational planning for the many special events scheduled out to the fall to include Children's Week, Labor Day weekend, seafood festival, and a variety of running and bicycling events that extend to Columbus Day weekend. Going into the statistics uh, for the same period compared to last year, our calls for service are down 15%. Motor vehicle stops are down 41%. Arrests are down 11%. DWIs are up 82%. <laughs> Drug offenses down 30%. Incidents <clears throat> reported up 17%. Offenses down 4%. Felonies up 16%. Parking tickets down 24%. And I would entertain any questions from the board. Questions for the Chief and Deputy Chief, and Mrs. Wolseley. Uh, Deputy, how's, how's your little boy doing? He okay after? Oh, he's great, yes. That? Okay. Um, just really quickly, thank you for having that uh, uh, an area where you can dispose of the medications, the opioids, whatever, that you have down at the police station. And that did get good um, publicity, I think, in the media. And that's a good thing. I wish every department would be able to do that. 
Um, are you having a problem with this vaping stuff on the beach? We get a lot of complaints about it as to what people are vaping. And people are trying to breathe. Yes. It, it, not so much that. It's it's <laughs> some of the vapes uh, do include uh, illegal items such as THC that people are vaping. Yeah. Liqu liquid marijuana. Yeah. Um, that is going on. We do get complaints, but, but keep in mind that uh, marijuana. Uh, has been decriminalized, personal possession, so it's less of an issue uh, to most people. So are you handcuffed from being able to enforce or get rid of it or shoo them away or? Well, it's not handcuffed. It's, it's simply, I kind of look at it the same way we treat an open can of beer at this point. Uh, well, we have I'm... shied away from locking people up simply for the open can of beer unless there's some other extenuating circumstance like they're underage or being disorderly. We prefer just to give the hand summons because as far as risk management goes, if we don't need to bring somebody into the booking room, that's a good thing to do because yeah. once we put cuffs on somebody, whatever happens to them, we own liability-wise. Yeah. So a lot of things have changed uh, from the Hampton, you know, we've seen a lot of changes in the Hampton Beach. Well, the police department has to change the way we do business. Speaking so, about beer, yeah. now are you having problems with bottles? I know cans, but bottles especially on the beach. Are people doing a lot of drinking on the beach and just leaving the bottles and glass behind? Because we are having a big problem with, with glass waste as part of the waste stream. Somebody that's been here since 1979 and yeah. I've been, a, been with this department since 1995, I can't say that I've seen any in, a dramatic increase or decrease in the use of bottles per se compared to years past. No, I can't really articulate that. Okay, and um, I do want to ask, um, I'm going to put on the agenda, uh, Mr. Chairman, I do have some questions um, on the uh, outside um, private details that the chief has been doing in other communities and bringing other um, officers into our community. So that's something I'd like to discuss with the board uh, when you have time to put it on the schedule. Go ahead. What? You want what? Well, what I'm trying to figure out, it's my understanding that the chief of police um, position, I'm talking about the position, is non-union. He, he runs the police department. Okay, so this is going to be about overtime. That's what you're talking about? Well, yes, because okay, we're I... we're going to be talking about that at a I'm separate not, time. Well, I'm not, I'm not talking overtime. I'm talking about... What you, I, you need to talk about his report tonight. Yes, okay, fine. Then I will ask you for time to discuss um, the chief's service um, at a later date. Regina. Thank you. Thank you, Chief and Deputy. Um, glad to see. So you're going to have four new part-timers start in August? Is At the right? Academy, correct. Awesome. So, and great. I wanted to say, too, on the 4th of July fireworks, I was watching them down on North Beach, mm -hmm. and then obviously the mass exodus, because you guys had them funneling <laughs> out of town. Yeah. And we actually went through the town to see how they funneled out, and it was pretty, pretty, pretty impressive. I mean, you had... I think, great job. I mean, how, how fast did you clear the beach? It wasn't very long. Well, I think the, the, the barometer we always look at, believe it or not, is Ashworth Avenue. Ashworth Avenue is the greatest source of congestion that we experience because a lot of people try to go south, and you, you go in two lanes until you narrow down to one at the bridge, mm -hmm. and then when you get to 286. And that's a constant issue we have, plus with the bridge going up for the boats, um, it's a problem. So when we were preparing for the 4th, um, we kind of wanted to take another look at it as to what could we do just to try to encourage people to go north. Mm -hmm. Even though they want to get to the Commonwealth, it is actually quicker if you go Ocean Boulevard to High Street and out that Definitely. way. So we tried to come up with ways to encourage people to do that. One of the things we started doing was we started borrowing uh, variable message boards from Homeland Security mm -hmm. to help us in that mission to get people going the right way. Uh, but we were still having that backup. So this year... Um, Lieutenants and the deputy came up with a great plan that from 8th Street north, we bar when the fireworks started, we barricaded all the down streets on the beach so you couldn't turn down. If you were heading northbound, you had to stay northbound. You couldn't turn down to get down to Ashworth Ave. Mm. 
We additionally blocked all of the cut throughs on the center parking lot uh, from the Ashworth all the way up to Boar's Head. And then additionally, the cut throughs all the way from Boar's Head up to where the road uh, comes together at about 4th Street. Uh, we feel that that really worked great because what normally takes two hours to unlock the congestion on uh, down on Ashworth Ave, it was moving freely within 45 minutes. And that's when people get frustrated as well. Well, we always, the thing we try to focus on, and I know people get frustrated with our focus on certain topics, and I know people get upset about the fireworks and all that, the personal fireworks, and we share the concern. But the issue that we have to prior, prioritize is, is acts of violence. And we know through our history that when that traffic sits still for a right. long time, people trying to cut in, you remember years past when we had altercations that involved baseball bats and people being stabbed <laughs> and firearms being pointed at people, road rage incidents. Okay. We have found that if we keep that traffic moving, I won't say we can ever eliminate it, but we certainly minimize that type of activity in our community. So by moving the traffic all the way north up uh, 1A, all the way up to High Street and then out and having people at the, the proper intersections to keep the outgoing traffic the priority, I, th I thought we had a great success. No, I mean, you had, yep. it was one of it, they were coming up. I mean, it was weird seeing all those cars downtown at like 11 o'clock at yeah, night. Yeah, it's, a little, say, it's a little different. It, it seemed to work really well. And I thank you for what you just said about fireworks on the beach because that is the complaints I hear like, oh, mm. why did HPD do this? Why did HPD do that? So now you just clarified it all for me, so I appreciate it. Now, I normally go over the fourth in my next quarter report, but since it's so close to the time, I, w I do want to share that we did get some extra support this year um, from State Parks. They provided us with a couple of park rangers okay. who we sent up to um, the numbered streets, the State Park area there, and they just walked the wall. And we weren't looking to make arrests or right people. We just want people to curb that activity, and it seemed that we had fewer uh, fireworks complaints coming from that area because that's usually where we get most of our complaints for personal fireworks is that North Shore area. So having the park rangers there walking the wall <coughs> and whitening people to the, uh, the prohibition on that conduct mm -hmm. I think helped us a lot. Thank you. Mr. Waddell. Yeah, good, good, good job, good report. The thing that bothers me, well, one thing is, you know, still two overdose deaths, you know, that's yep. disturbing. And the, and the, DWI is going up so high. I was going to address that a little bit after. You can see I have some of my okay. friends from the state police here, All so right. I was going to address that when we were done with the. the okay, I'll report. hold off on that then. And but but super good job. You did a good job on the fourth. It was everything went well. Good job. Must have been the deputy that did it all. Mr. Brian. Who is everywhere? <laughs> I noticed you're, you're parking, your, your tickets are down. Is, is that due to manpower or is that? No, I attribute the, the, the drop in the tickets um, to that wet weather we had. If you remember, we kind of look at that time period between Memorial Day to the 4th of July is a, a very critical time for us because we're understaffed. Um, mm -hmm. Our new people haven't hit the streets yet. Yeah. And one of the things that saved us a little bit but hurt the business community was it was wet and cold every weekend up until the week before the 4th. So I attribute that uh, to the, the, the down numbers you see in the parking tickets. We have the same uh, team of folks out there, and, and they're very eager, and they're out there doing, very vigilant in enforcing the parking. It's just it's been wet and cold, so we haven't had that opportunity. Very good. So. Thank you. Okay. Um, so thanks for your report. Um, Everything seems to be going good to me from what I've seen. Um, and what about the state troopers? Are there, there, are, there have been some state troopers. Yes, I, want to, I, I couldn't help but uh, I watched the meeting last week, uh, the last meeting with some interest. I heard some of the comments tonight. And I think there's just a little bit of a, a misunderstanding about how the New Hampshire State Police interact with the Hampton Police Department. So I reached out uh, last week uh, Regarding the DWI issue we're experiencing, it's it's up 82 percent, and it, that's just unacceptable by any measurement. And the problem we're having is, I believe every report I've come in at this time of year, and you know, in my fifth year as chief, it's steadily been increasing. Okay, so we need to approach that from a couple different levels. One, obviously, the immediate one is enforcement, increased enforcement, more people out there looking for folks driving impaired. In the past, we have cooperated with the state police and the Seabrook police to conduct uh, sobriety checkpoints, uh, 
over the bridge, although those do draw some controversy <laughs> and the effectiveness, that checkpoint happens to be one of the more effective ones that is conducted throughout the state. So we utilize that as a way to train some of our newer officers to go work with the troopers in Seabrook PD uh, to try to curb it in that area. The other way we're going to approach it is just with saturation grants. We're going to have uh, Hampton officers, state troopers, and whoever else I can get to come down here and help us just out there on our key areas, our peak times, and just roving the streets of Hampton and Hampton Beach looking for folks that are impaired. One of the things we're learning is because of our cooperation with our neighbors that they're also making DWI arrests and what the goal is is identify where they had their last drink. And many communities around us are reporting that the people that they're stopping in their communities for DWI are coming from Hampton Beach, okay? It's one of those things. We, we have made this a destination, a desirable place so I can tell you the, the unruly behavior that we used to experience, the disorderly conducts, the assaults, the level that we used to see, as you can see from the statistics, they're down. The one area we're experiencing a, a, a real problem is the impaired driving and, and the people walking around that are, are intoxicated. So the people being overserved? Absolutely. There, there's no other way to put it, and I you know I try to work well with the business community and we've tried to warn them, but they've because of the situation we're experiencing, we have no choice but to ramp up uh, in a couple of areas. One will be the enforcement. Um, tonight I have with me uh, Colonel Wagner from the State Police and Captain Vetter. Uh, and I would highlight that Captain Vetter is a resident of the town of Hampton, began his career here at Hampton PD. And the Colonel also spends quite a bit of time in Hampton as he has family and visits this, this fine community on many occasions. So the relationship uh, that we have with the State Police is outstanding. We will be increasing our operations and our contact with the state police trying to address the problem, but one of the things I did want to address is the perception that they haven't been here, okay, or when they are here. The state police historically have come in to assist the Hampton Police Department at the invitation of the chief of police. Statutorily, that's who can invite them in and control and coordinate those operations. We have always had a good relationship with the state police, but I've highlighted, I believe, in every one of my reports that the state police is up against the same thing we are in Hampton and in Manchester and now you name the department it's there are fewer far fewer people coming in to take the test as you can see from my uh, my report on the recruiting back in the day we would have 600 people show up to take the test for Hampton PD now we're lucky if we get a hundred they have the same problem the other problem you have is the level of experience with the turnover rates. And the other thing is the workforce has changed, as we've noted in many of our discussions with the business community. Finding people willing to come in and work the extra hours is difficult. It's the same for us. We hire great people, as do the state police. But they can decide whether they want to come in and work extra in the overtime. And that is part of the problem, is the folk, the workforce today is different than what it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. People don't work as many hours. That's just the statistical fact. And that makes it difficult for us to try to schedule and field. And I think I've mentioned before, at some point we may have to look at expanding in, and increasing our numbers simply to cover, not because of any increases, just to cover the mission operations we have today. We may have to consider increasing our staffing levels full time to cover those because relying on overtime and people staying for the extra is getting hotter and hotter to accomplish. Okay. The second part I wanted to mention is I did reach out to uh, the chief of New Hampshire Liquor Enforcement Bureau, is, uh, Mark Armaganian. The other way we're going to attack this is we're going to be doing saturations uh, with liquor enforcement folks going into the establishments mm -hmm. and identifying people that are intoxicated in the establishments. If you're not aware, uh, that can't happen by, by New Hampshire law, by administrative rule, Intoxicated patrons are not allowed to remain on the premises of a licensed establishment. They're responsible for this. They have to deal with it. And it doesn't appear that that's what's going on at a pretty alarming rate. Mm -hmm. So we're going to, again, go after the enforcement action of the people that are getting behind the wheel and, or committing other crimes in this community. But we're also going to, we, we have no choice. We have to go deal with these, these licensees that are not taking care of the problem in their establishments, and hopefully we can reduce this, this dramatic increase we've seen. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman? 
Oh. It's my time to talk right oh, now. Okay. And you, you know, we'll get to you in a moment. Um, <clears throat> we have had, you know, I thank you for your report and uh, as long as we're just talking about it now, I understand that there is an establishment in the B Street area that's <laughs> causing a lot of problems uh, for people that have a motel that's adjacent to it. Um, and it, you know, I'm sure that you're taking a look at that, but these people seem to be quite bothered and have had to go out and hire people to uh, assist in the protection of their business. Um, so I think... You know, can, being able to control the people that are in these establishments is important, especially when they're on their way out. Um, you know, I, so I guess you're saying that people, after they've been shut off, they still stay in the clubs and... You'll see people leaving one, one establishment and walk down to the next mm -hmm. and really should not be served. It's pretty obvious mm -hmm. just watching them walk that, that they've, they've had their share. Um, it's time to call it a night, and it, it's the problem is, is we have such a short season. And when you add on that we've had this wet, cold weather, and, and with the explosion of outdoor venues that we have, that people really rely on good weather to, to have a successful year or not, I suspect that they're trying to cram it all into a shortened period because of the weather. And I think that just opens us up to more possibility of people being overserved, yeah. and it just has to be addressed. And I, I, I would, I was hoping that the folks would take the lead on it themselves, but with these statistical numbers, that's very obvious that's not occurring. And unfortunately, that that's the role we play when when they can't handle it on their own. We have to step in and intercede uh, with our partners, with the state police, liquor enforcement, sheriffs, and, and our other partners to come in to assist us to try to stop this before a tragedy occurs. We have been very fortunate this year that we have not had a fatality in Hampton. Mm -hmm. But I think that's just luck. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope that mm -hmm. when you get um, invited to comment at the planning board for all of the new places that are opening with open decks, that you'll keep all these issues in mind. Mm -hmm. Because we do have people that are still complaining about Bernie's Beach Bar. Uh, Mrs. Witcher that's over there is one of them. I'm sure you're used to, or your department's used to get receiving her calls because she lives right on the face of Boar's Head. As are people from um, the Boar's Head condos on the corner uh, say that they have been having a problem with the noise. I can hear it from my house. Personally, it doesn't bother me. I'm just, you know, I don't even pay attention to noise. I'm too busy not paying attention to motorcycle noise to worry about during the speech <laughs> bar. Um, but I will tell you, people on Winnicunit Road that are on the marsh, they're complaining too. So there are people complaining, and I think it's, you know, we realize that this is the way it's going to be, that there, uh, you know, these are issues that we're going to have to look at in the future. Um, but in the future, when other places are approved, you got to keep these things in mind. Um, and I will tell you that when these people do complain, uh, multiple people have said they do get relief. They hear the music go down. And I've heard that like on multiple occasions. So it does seem that it pays off to call and complain. Absolutely. I would encourage yeah. anybody that has a complaint about noise or any other issue. I know they get frustrated, but I, we also get frustrated because in I'm the sure. past we come here and we hear from somebody on the board, there's not much I can do with that. I have to hear it in the timeline when it's occurring. So I would encourage anybody in the public, if you're having an issue with noise, somebody lighting on fireworks, whatever it is that's causing you those, those quality of life issues in this community, pick up the phone, call our dispatch center, and we will get an officer out there to investigate as soon as we can. But I would also ask you to understand something. The fact that somebody complains in itself does not make it a violation. Mm -hmm. we, have a, we have a duty to go out and we've, we've We've done the entertainment ordinance to, to death, and I don't want to do another one. Um, we have to go out and abide by what the standards that are that we have accepted as, as a community. So when we go out there, we'll measure the sound, but a lot of times, I know it's annoying sometimes, but they're not violations of the ordinance. We do go down, if there's an officer working in detail at, at that particular establishment, or an officer in the area, we go down and we uh, approach them. And I believe... Most of the business owners down there don't want to be looked at by their neighbors that way. And even if they're not over the limit, they settle it down a little bit pretty quickly for us. They're, they're trying to get along the best they can 
but it's that competing harms of trying to get along with your neighbors, but you're trying to make make your business profits in that short period of time. So I'll have to look at it. I wasn't prepared to deal with that. I haven't noticed a lot of those complaints coming across my desk, but I will take a look at the statistics to see where we're at with that. No, it seems like, like I said, people do notice that yep. the music does go down after they complain. So yep. they, and I will tell you that the people are feel well respected by the people that show up to yeah. um, investigate. Yeah. I've heard several comments of that. Yeah. Other uh, things here tonight is we've had um, Stephanie Long uh, c complained about, and I'm sure you must have gotten the letters, about the parking situation. I assume it's at the Hedis mm -hmm. High Street, right, um, yeah. Mr. Welch? Yes. About um, people from <clears throat> that shouldn't be parked there being parked. Yep. I went up there actually myself today. Uh, I was going to meet somebody for a lunch, and uh, I figured I'd take a swing up at the watch, take a look. I did identify one car, and as I was hanging the ticket on the car, the young lady came out and moved it so I didn't hang the ticket on it. We try to be fairly reasonable with that. Mm -hmm. To that end, you have to understand something. Um, when you look at the cars, unfortunately, because of the way the inspection stickers have changed, we've changed the location, and a lot of people don't read the slip that comes with it as to where to locate the sticker. So if they don't, if the if the parking enforcement person doesn't see the sticker where it's supposed to be, and they're trying to get through those lots as fast as they can, you may get a ticket if you haven't put the sticker in the right place. Just let us know. Uh, we're easy to work with when it comes to the ticket appeals. Uh, we're not looking to gouge anybody. We just want to make sure our residents are getting the parking they deserve. The other issue is it's not truly a resident sticker. It's more of a taxpayer sticker because we issue mm. stickers to anybody that owns property in this town. So you will see cars. I saw one today uh, in one of our handicap spots. It had a Florida tag on it. Mm. And when I looked, to, went up to look, it had an appropriate Hampton uh, parking sticker issued to it. So people have to understand that just because you see an out-of-state plate does not mean they're That's not eligible point. to have a sticker. Yeah. We get a lot of that. We go up there sometimes and people claim it's not and we look, yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Because we do permit as a community people that if you own property in the town of Hampton and you pay taxes, you're eligible for one of those stickers. So. Yeah, because a lot of them homestead exemption and then they register their car yep. in Florida. Yep. Um, the other thing that we <coughs> have is Molten Road. Now we're going to be discussing that a little further. Yep. Uh, is, are you going to be here for that? I wasn't planning on it, but... Do we need him there for that? For that? I can address it very quickly. I support... Um, I know there was some question as to whether we had to do some engineering on it, uh, but I think the quickest, easiest way to curb the issue there is to put the three-way stop sign in. Um, it's minimal expense, um, yeah. and it's just a question of whether do we need to do any type of traffic study on it to do it, uh, to change it. I'm not, and that's not my, my area. I think we'd have to talk to Public Works and I'm sure the manager's got more, far more expertise on that than I. Uh, but I would support, if it's legal to do so, to establish a three-way stop. In so you're in favor of I that? I am absolutely yeah. in favor of Okay, great. And um, uh, so I appreciate that you came in tonight, Mrs. Wolseley. Yes, really quickly. Um, I, uh, Hampton Beach State Park is a state park. It's my understanding that in the rest of the state, with the other state parks, the state police are the primary law enforcement entity. That is, that is misinformation. No? I, w I, I heard your comments uh, yeah. at the last meeting, and it was kind of ironic. Because I've been told, you know. And I, and I understand that. Uh, and I'm not trying to be contradictory. I'm just trying to give you what I know to be uh, the right. facts. In the state of New Hampshire, in a community of 3,000 or more people, the state police can come in at the invitation of the chief of police or by direction of right. the attorney general, okay? Right. Most of the state parks down this way it are all communities uh, of 3,000 or more. So I happen to be watching a Channel 9 article uh, on how, it, I think it was Bear Brook State Park that they had to close mm -hmm. by 10 a.m. because of every- Patuckaway. Patuckaway. And directing traffic was the local police officer. Oh, okay. So primarily in those areas where there's a, a municipal police department, the municipal mm -hmm. police department handles mm -hmm. those issues. Certainly the state police comes in for any assistance if it's necessary. Um, but primarily in Hampton, we have not used the state police in that capacity. Mm -hmm. You go back to when I started with this department in 1995, we had a lot of walking beats. And, you know, we'd, we'd augment, you know, we'd have... Two Hampton officers walking from A to D Street mm -hmm. and two troopers walking A to D yeah. Street. 
and we would mix it up that way, mm -hmm. and that worked well at the time. But circumstances have changed in the crowds. We don't get those huge mobs of crowds like we used to. The biggest issue we're facing now is when people want to leave Hampton Beach, they want to leave now. And we saw that the week before the 4th on that weekend where the traffic was uh, backed up in that picture of, of a Hampton cruiser going the wrong way to try to get to a call mm -hmm. on Ocean Boulevard up by your establishment, Mr. Griffin. Those are the things we're really trying to work on now because the traffic flow is everything. Trying to get people out of that congested area because, let's face it, we've done a great job making Hampton Beach a destination. Mm -hmm. And they're coming. They're, they're coming to Hampton Beach. I've, I've never... In my time in this community, seeing the volume of cars that we're experiencing over the last couple of summers, the 4th of July, mm -hmm. in my opinion, and it, it's just my opinion as a police officer in this community for many years and having been a resident here, that is the largest group of vehicles I've ever seen uh. at, Hampton, at a Hampton Beach event. It was, it was incredible. So we are now more mobile. We don't have as many walking beats, particularly with the state police. Mm -hmm. When we collaborate with other people and other entities, we try to use people to their strengths. The New Hampshire State Police does a, an incredible job in the area of DWI apprehension and motor vehicle enforcement. That's their primary, that's their big thing. That's what they mm -hmm. do better than anybody. So instead of having them walk around on the beat, I put them out on those positions. You'll see them up, uh, we were having a lot of problems and we're still experiencing a lot of problems up on the North Shore with some of these car clubs coming into town and, and, and laying rubber up in that area. Mm -hmm. Well, I send you know a couple of my folks up there, but I also send a couple of troopers up there to address the issue, and we found that to be far more effective utilization of our combined forces. Well, I'm just tired of the state fobbing everything off on the town like they do on the waste. Yeah. So I was wondering if they were no, withholding... No, absolutely, and, and here's my concern with this, ma'am. I've heard your comments, and... and while I, as a taxpayer, I appreciate you looking out for me and making sure we're getting our due with the, with the state mm -hmm. and many issues, I can assure you when it comes to the public safety mission, the law enforcement mission, the relationship between the Hampton Police Department and the New Hampshire State Police has never been better oh. and more coordinated. I know you may not see the, the physical bodies as much as you used to. Yeah. It's because we're utilizing them different, and we are all working with fewer yeah. people. Yeah. I'm not questioning that. Yeah. I have, I'm not being critical of the state police. I just like to have the state of New Hampshire step it up okay. in their own Thank park. You. That's the political process. Wait a minute. And I just, I, because you mentioned uh, Captain Vetter, formerly Lieutenant Vetter, uh, he was very helpful to me in... Uh, 2016 and uh, educated me on the rape statute. Thank you. Um, Regina. Yeah, yeah. I definitely, I don't want anyone to think that I'm critical of any of the police departments. Mm -hmm. I've, obviously, I've always supported HPD and the state troopers. But what I am telling you and what I've been saying for the past month is based on talking to Hampton business owners mm -hmm. who have been down there for 15, 20, 25 years, specifically the south end of the beach. They, we, they're used to it. I mean, you guys, I guess, spoiled them of seeing police <laughs> everywhere down there. You know, yeah, we had busy 4th of July weekend, but you know, I was down that beach every single night and the traffic never cleared out of it until 11, 11.30 at night. I mean, you stayed at work till then. It mm. backed up, you might as well just stay, you know? And, uh, so I think what you're saying now is people get more aggravated easier. You know, they always got something else they got to do and they want to leave in a hurry. So you need to focus on that. But I have people telling me down in the south end of the beach that they feel like if they needed a police officer, whether it be HPD or whoever is down there working, that it would take them too long mm. to get there. And they've never had that feeling before. So maybe I should have stated it in a different way, but these people have been down there and they've seen it and they, not only do they have businesses down there, but some of them live down there. Yeah. And that, that's the feedback I'm getting down on the South Beach, Patriots Corner specifically, some business owners is in, in there, and people that have businesses on the back strip. I mean, I know it when I go down there. I don't spend as much time down there as I used to, but I do spend a fairly good amount of time down there. And we all know that when people see the police, they tend to 
you know, back off or maybe not even come. Mm -hmm. And I know Fourth of July was a normal day. I see, I see the state troopers up on North Beach, and I know you guys always have mm -hmm. issues with the uh, those cars that come in the car clubs, yeah. the race cars or whatever they are. And I always see them up there. But I'm just telling you that everything I say is based on feedback, and most of the mm -hmm. feedback I get is people that have been doing it for a long time too. Mm -hmm. So I'm just letting you know that's where it's coming from. We ha we have to appreciate the simple fact is this is we've gone beyond the time of doing more with less. We are at a time that we're going to do less with less. Hmm. Okay, until the tide changes to the issues with recruitment and dealing with budgetary issues, we're going to, you know, less is less now. You know, we, we for a lot of years, we, we did more with less. We, we've gone past that line. It, it just, it's not possible. I can't do with, you know, 32 officers what I used to do in 2006 when I took over scheduling when I had 55. It, it, it's just a numbers game. Mm -hmm. When I used to do the schedule with 55, we were working over 230 shifts a week with part-time <laughs> officers. <laughs> we're working less than 100 shifts a week yeah. now with part-time officers. Yeah. So it's, you know, I appreciate what you're saying, and I, I, I do like hearing the feedback. I look at it this way. I can't promise you more. What I can try to do is when we try to look at what are we going to accomplish today, or tonight, you know, on a busy Friday night, is the prioritization of calls. So sometimes I know people think it's not that I, that I don't care about their issue of parking or noise or fireworks. I do care about those quality of life issues. But we're too busy or too involved that in the old yeah. days, you could count on any call in this town, you'd have an officer there within three minutes. Mm -hmm. yeah. That time range has now changed. Yeah. If we can get to you on those things while they're ongoing, We'll get to you, but if it's a fireworks call, uh, it's a parking issue. It's just a it's a lower priority to the thing, the complexity of the issues we're dealing with. I'm hopeful in my career we'll see that change and the recruitment comes back and we can start getting the numbers back up to where we can achieve that level of perception that people want. But it's going to take a while. Yeah, just for the record, I don't no. think anyone's saying that you should be doing. I'm just saying that this seems to be another example where it be, would be nice if the town of Hampton could have some sort of support from the state of New Hampshire. Yes. I mean, it's their beach, too. It yes. is their beach. It is and their beach. But, it's, you know, but it's, I'll have to respectfully disagree. Okay? The determination of who enforces what in the town of Hampton lies with the chief of police. And I'm telling you, I'm getting all the support that the state police can muster. And I like to tell people um, that if they have a complaint, they need to bring it to you. You can't do anything with it if they don't complain. I make it a matter of a point with every single person that discusses something with me that if they want me to follow up on it, they need to complain. Because unless they make a complaint to either Mr. Welch or the chief, if mm -hmm. you're the one that's involved, or if the fire chief mm -hmm. is the one that's involved, yeah. if they don't make a complaint to them, there's no way that I can follow up on it. So I make a point of that. Correct. Thank you for coming in tonight. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Next, we have Michael Dugan, parking request. So <coughs> you, had to sit, you get the award for, uh, <laughs> for the longest Farrow. wait that we've had in recent uh, We don't meetings. have Jen Hale? No, we have a lot, Farrow. but I mean. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, well, we'll let Mr. Dugan speak. Okay. Michael Duggan and I represent the uh, Gables Homeowners Association, 989 Ocean Boulevard. And the reason we're here is that a couple months back, we found that six of our townhomes had severe structural damage mm -hmm. on the rear. And I can show you pictures if anybody's interested. Yep. But they're. You, um, you need to get uh, to be able to use the town parking. Yeah, that's what, that's what the board is asking for to use that lot uh, overnight, permission to park overnight, four to six vehicles for about a two-month period, yeah. and, and a lot between Cusack and High Street. Okay, and Mr. Welch, what do you say about that? As long as the board approves it, we'll issue the necessary documents. Mm -hmm. I make a motion that we approve it. Yeah, second. I'll second. Any further discussion? No. Thank you very much for Thank coming. Thank you. In. Should we all check all with somebody favor. or do something? Well, please see Christina in the selectman's office, and she, we'll make sure she issues. Okay. It. Thank you very much. much. People agree with you. Sorry you had to wait. That's all right. Jen, you want to join us at the table? Um, Poor Jen. <laughs> Punishment for not going to the solid waste committee last Monday. <laughs> <laughs>
No, we actually have a lot of good stuff. So, um, where do you want to start? Well, whatever you'd like to do. All right. I believe uh, on the agenda, um, we have four bids that we're looking to uh, get approved today. Uh, the first one is bid 2019-003. This is for two three-quarter ton heavy-duty trucks. These were trucks that were approved during town meeting in 2019. So the purchase itself has already been uh, approved from the town warrant. Uh, we did put it out to bid. We did send it uh, to, I believe, uh, according to my list here, uh, multiple contractors. Um, in essence of more than 10, um, only one company responded. So we are asking that the board uh, award the bid to Liberty Chevrolet uh, and that a waiver be um, granted because we received less than those three bids. I'm the total much. amount is $32,825 per truck, a total of $65,650 within the value in the warrant. We have a motion and a second. Second. All those in favor? Oh, I have a question. Please do. I have my um, color-coded list of vehicles. What what numbers are being replaced? What number of vehicles? So this is two three-quarter ton trucks. So we are replacing... Uh, I think I asked for a new 2019, sheet. replacing number 40. We're replacing number 53 and number 63. Uh, bear with me one second. Yeah. Um, here's an easier way to do this. Yeah. So I think I asked for a current printout. You did. It's the same list with oh, the new trash trucks added oh. to it. Like okay. I said, these are the trucks that were already approved to be replaced. Yes, we're not I, changing any of but that. But I plan. just want to identify what they're replacing. Uh, two three-quarter ton trucks are replacing units 26 and unit 16. 26 and 16? Um, and at this time, if it's not... 16, it would be 15. Um, there's two of them that are the same 15. dilapidated okay. ability. They're going to take whatever's worse off the road. And do you have, and you probably don't have it with you, but what I'd like to know is how old are these exist? Well, I can find out how old they are by looking at my list, but the, one of the concerns here is the maintenance. And have we, have we incurred huge maintenance costs so that we need to replace these two vehicles. Yes, that's why they went on the warrant to get replaced. Well, right, and but following that, is it cheaper to lease and not, not build up all vehicles. that? Not for those? No. Okay, well I thought I would ask you uh, anyway. Um, okay, I will, I'll make a note on my... Yeah, not for these vehicles, not for the current structure of how our department is running. Uh, the bigger, larger priced vehicles we've been leasing. Okay. These you're doing two for sixty five thousand. So what's gonna happen with the old vehicles? They're they get traded in and the price gets credited to what we um, I love it. Okay. So the they're bill. not sitting on the lot right. No, they are traded in as part of this deal. Okay, excellent. Uh, I um, I'm happy to hear that. Thank you. Regina? I'm good. Ready to go. Mr. I'm good. It was all answered but by the Warren article and everything else before. Rusty? No, just go ahead. Okay. We have, we have a motion and a second, so. We have a, well, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, unanimous. And the waiver. And the waiver. I'll motion and waiver. I'll second it. All those in favor, unanimous. Wonderful, thank you. And then you. we need one for the one ton? Right, so bid 2019-004 again was on the warrant. Uh, this is a replacement of one one-ton heavy-duty truck with a dump body. Exact same scenario went out to the same bidders. Liberty, Liberty Chevrolet uh, has uh, put in a bid that is within the dollar amount. Total dollar amount is $58,037. Make a motion we accept that. And the waiver at the same time. And, and what vehicle is this replacing? This is replacing number 30. Number 30, okay. okay. All those in favor? Unanimous. And all right, bid number 
2019-005. Uh, we did put out our paving bid. This is the that we do yearly. We use the highway block grant funds uh, that are uh, given to us, and then the Warren article, Warren article uh, 21, also appropriated uh, funding to supplement road paving. What we did this year is we put out a list of roads greater than 1,000 feet that needed work, as well as a list under 1,000, mm -hmm. knowing that we might be able to attract the larger pavers and then uh, some smaller pavers yeah. to do the smaller work. Uh, it didn't work. We had two bidders that came back in, Brock's and Pike. Uh, Brock's is the lowest uh, responsible bidder. Mm -hmm. They have paved for us before. Um, because uh, part of the highway block fund grants are also used for roadways that have drainage underneath it so you can do it as one package. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, while we have a list of roads to be done, uh, we want to get some of the drainage done first. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm asking the board um, to accept the bid and that the board authorize the town manager to enter contracts with Brox Industries and to sign a purchase order, but not to exceed $390,000. So this way, if it comes in less and we negotiate scope, uh, that's fine. That would be the max dollar amount. Yeah. I'll make that motion. Second. And then also need a waiver because of two instead of the three. I'll include the waiver in my motion. And are, do you second the waiver, Jim? Yes. All those in favor? Unanimous. That new lease truck is pretty clever. The, it is one big lease trash. <laughs> um, the last one here, um, I know Renee led uh, to it as far as the playground. So this is the Park Avenue culvert replacements. Yes. Uh, this was yeah. also on the Warren. It was Warren Article 24 at town meeting. Um, this happens, uh, and we find a way to deal with it. But in this case, the Warren Article was put out for 240 uh, $224,650. The idea of getting one group in to mobilize, replace the two culverts over uh, at the Tuck Field entrance, and then the one large arch culvert that goes uh, from Eaton Park, as well as the culvert that goes between King's Kingdom uh, and the parking lot right off of Park Avenue. Yeah. All that work uh, we put out to bid. We did get three bids. Um, however, the lowest bid did come in greater than the funding for the Warren article. Yeah. Uh, we've spent some time going through it. We've talked about maybe doing one part of it this year and one part of it next year. But looking at the funding that we have with the Warren article, funding in our actual budget for drain lines and sewer lines, meaning an overall uh, budget somewhat like we did for Ann's Lane, knowing that that little amount isn't going to get me something no. somewhere else, that it would be best spent supplementing the money yeah. uh, to get the Park Avenue culverts replaced. Good. Um, so working with some of the highway block grant, block grant money, working with our budget line items, and the Warren article, uh, we are recommending that the board authorize the town manager to negotiate a contract uh, with some co-environmental. They were the lowest bidder uh, for this project. We have reached out to the uh, their references, very high recommendations, very good to work with, and uh, work that was done very well. Um, so I give you all of that um, with one side part, that in talking to all the contractors from when it went out to bid uh, until up to the actual bid date schedule was the biggest concern. Um, mm -hmm. There was, they are not going to be able to complete both projects by the start of school. What we have negotiated is that they start at the tuck field portion, mm -hmm. yeah. get that done before school, and then we work with the SAU and we do the arch culvert in the King's Kingdom portion. Uh, what that allows is that once school's in section, they have an entrance from Winniconnet Road and then the one from Park Avenue will be open. They'll just go down the triangle on the other side. Hmm. So access is less impeded. Um, what that does do is it does delay the King's Kingdom playground. Um, it makes zero sense to put that back up until we're done with the construction. Most importantly, yeah. we also need the staging area uh, for the materials and the equipment, and that is the best place having those projects right there. Hmm. Uh, so that is the other part of this thing. 
Okay. Um, are you finished with your? Yep, that is yeah. the presentation. Okay. Part of it. Mrs. Wolsey. Just really quickly, when is the Route One construction starting, my dear? I don't want to depress you, but yeah, um, that would. We're looking for a bid in the next two to three weeks. It would be a fall start after Seafood Festival. Regina. So, what is the bid for the? So, the bid for Sumco for both. Uh, the Park Avenue culvert replacements is for a total of $484,010. Yeah, wow. So that's like twice as much as what we appropriated for it. Yep. Mr. And a lot of that comes from the arch culvert itself, mm -hmm. um, getting it. Would it you needs. like to comment on this, Mr. Welch? It needs to be done. Uh, I've been over this entire thing with Public Works, uh, very satisfied with their, uh, with their results. Yeah. I recommend you approve it. And Mr. Waddell? <clears throat> Yeah, I'll make the motion to approve it. I'll second. And did you want to have yeah, something? Yeah, and I, I just, are you guys going to get out there and, and you know, uh, <laughs> publicize why the King's Kingdom is? Cause Absolutely. So, so I did reach out. In your name I before. even told Renee I would take the grunt of it. Um, okay. <laughs> we will work with signage. We'll work with signage package. We can put one of the message boards out yeah. there. Yeah. Um, this is an infrastructure project. I know people don't see it because it's under the ground. But it's as important as our sewer replacement Absolutely. projects and everything else we do. Yeah. First, Steve. No, I think uh, we, we need to get it done. I we have a first and we have a second. It, All I, those in. I would like to have one more discussion. Um, I agree with you. I agree with the board, but I'm nervous. I'm a little bit wary because it's twice the amount of money that was approved at town meeting. So with we advertise about Kids Kingdom. If you could just make sure that it's explained why we're spending four hundred and eighty thousand yep. dollars. And I now. would like to do it here in public. One of the main reasons mm -hmm. this is done is because many of the projects that come out of public works when they go to warrant, they are not designed. Yeah. They are preliminary. They are conceptual in nature. An engineering firm was bought on. They're doing the permitting. They did full engineering designs. These require uh, multiple retaining walls that need to be constructed. Um, besides the arch pipes, the multiple covers, yeah. uh, eight-foot diameter structures, things that just weren't designed at the time Warren Articles were prepared. Yeah. So this is, when I started this, one of those unfortunate incidents that the Warren Article was less, but we are confident mm -hmm. that we have the funding to get it done. So we have a first and a second. All those in favor, it's unanimous. That's really important to get that done. Thank Wonderful. You. Uh, so we will work on that. So those are the four bids that I had. Uh, that I was looking for approval for. Uh, the one last piece that unfortunately didn't make it to your agenda, but I was here a few weeks ago. Uh, we talked about the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant opportunity for the yeah. Kings Highway Gentian flooding studies as well as the West of Ashworth Ave. Oh. Uh, we were selected to submit a full proposal. Good. Um, so with that, we are going after another 180 to 194 thousand dollars. Uh, in funding, as I reported to you, there is a um, section uh, through the full proposal process times that needs um, letters of support. Uh, I'm asking the board if they would sign the letter of support that I have yep. prepared. I'll leave it with you um, to read. It's very similar to the pre-proposal that you authorized. I'll also be asking the Conservation Commission, Malone and McBroom, uh, Hoyle Tanner Associates, the University of New Hampshire, and NHDES will all be writing letters on our behalf. Good. Thank you. Um, so I will leave that with you as soon as I figure out which pile I put it in. <laughs> Was yeah. that on there for anything else? No. So that's it. Well, well, thank you very much for coming in tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you. And Deputy Hale did an awesome uh, update to the Hampton Beach Village District on Wednesday. So there was quite a room full of people that were concerned about their properties. And she explained some of this as far as the other issues, how the issues down on the main beach. And the uh, information that I was handed out at that Prince meeting, uh, very similar. It's the pre-application uh, that was submitted, as well as the New Hampshire DES coastal resilience study that was done uh, for our culverts and determining vulnerability. That will be up on the website tomorrow for you mm -hmm. to review. Thank you. Nice Thank job, you. Jen. Next, Thank we you. have Susan Fox Farrow regarding 50 Drake Side Road issues. You need a butler, Jennifer. It's the letters. Yeah. We'll do that. Thank you. Hello. Hi, everybody. Thank you. I know everybody's probably tired. 
but bear with me. We did see the pictures. Did you? I wanted yeah. to know if you saw pictures. Yeah. I got a picture That's awful. Yeah. Um, yeah, I purchased my land in about 2006, and I have been having problems with I know rock, and it has reached a point of no return, um, and I was told that it never goes away. Um, I don't know if you all know what iron okra is or where it comes from, um, but it's a yellow, tannish, or like a red jelly substance. Um, and when it's red, it looks like a red slimy substance that appears to be like, a, um, uh, like an oil slick. Um, and when it dries, it shrinks, and it becomes very flaky. Um, this is all in my basement. Um, it's composed of many compounds, but mostly it contains iron deposits, which is mixed with a bacterial slime. Yeah. It's the slime which causes the failure of drainage systems by clogging the pipes, preparations, and it fills the internal volumes of the drains. Um, so the combination of iron compounds formed with the bacterial slime is what is known as the iron okra. Now, iron okra, in my research, is found in two sources. Number one is wetlands, or it can come from leachate. Mm. Um, and the iron okra is my number one problem. It's not the water. Um, I do live in wetlands. Um, I reached out to um, Evan Lewis from the New, Ham New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. Yeah. He came out and he did three soil studies. And he also told me like what was growing in my lawn and what was growing in the surrounding trees mm -hmm. is what grows in wetlands. Um, I reached out to Ray Ann here, Dion, um, and Pam Warner from the New Hampshire Bureau of Groundwater, and Jamie, who's the engineer for DES, as well. Um, and also, there's a Carly Kennerson. She's the Remediation Bureau of Abandonment Dump Number 2 in Hampton. So that kind of raised an issue for me as well, because I know Abandoned Dump 2 is right on Route 1, which I live right between uh, 101 and the old um, railroad bridge. Yeah. I live right there. So... Um, I am just, I, I, you know, I purchased my land um, from three sisters that told that they had reclaimed that property um, on Drake Side Road. It was industrial zoned, but the Hampton Zoning Board of Adjustments granted that option to me, the holder, mm. um, for the property to construct a home with a future garage there. Um, and I believe it was Alan Gothel was the chairman of the Conservation Commission at the time who inspected my property and claimed that it wasn't wetlands. Um, I do, I was given a heat map of the back of my property, which stated that, you know, wetlands was 50 feet, but it's not, um, within 40 feet of the wetlands. So, about three weeks ago, I had a major flood. Mm -hmm. It was from my sump pump failure. It was so corroded with this iron okra that I had That's a terrible. lot of damage. I was lucky that I had a sump pump, um, in, endowment on my insurance, so it covered that. And it's only going to cover what the damage was from the water. It doesn't cover any environmental issues. So with this never going away, um, I had Northeast Basement Systems come out. And what's going to have to be done, because anybody who lives near the coast should put in. I had a French drain. I did everything right. I have a French drain. I have a sump pump. Um, but now, with it so clogged, it will never go away. Even if you flush it or clean it, it will never go away. And what they do is I have to have an above cement ground new drain that has portals in it that will have to constantly be flushed. And they also recommended another sump pump. And with my major concern is I think it might be imperative to have that water tested to see if there is any leachate because it only comes from the two sources, from the wetland or the leachate. Um, I did have absolute resource. did do some of the water testing, and it is very high in iron, which we knew it would be from the sump pump. I do have town water, so I don't have any drinking water. I don't have my own well. So that is my issue. Okay. Um, and why do you feel that um, this is, uh, regard is, you know, can, can, how do you think your concerns are to the town of Hampton? My concerns come from, because this comes from two sources, um, I was sold maybe wetland because that's where it comes from, and maybe two. I don't know if anybody knows anything about the abandoned, abandoned dump two, where those, those dumps don't have any liners, and they do leak le leachate mm -hmm. over time. 
Um, I think my neighbor is seeing a little bit of the eye and okra, and I know, I think Ann Russell, who lives at the top of the street, sees very little, but not like I do for some reason. Mm -hmm. I just think I'm in total wetland. Do you have flood insurance? No, flood insurance is a totally different entity. It's very expensive, and I never thought I never. No, yeah, because flood I'm insurance. not sure that really with a, with a, I don't think they give flood insurance for a basements anymore. No. Uh, from what I understand, but I don't really know. I know that um, the house that I have, I had the same problem 40 years ago, and we elevated the house and got rid of the basement. I don't think anyone would recommend that you have a basement there. All my all of my utilities are down there. I know, but today. Uh, what they do is they put the utilities in the top floors if you want to have flood insurance, particularly. Um, but so your concerns about where the uh, would you like to say something about the dump or the transfer, whatever? What when what was the year that that was <clears throat> being used? I can't tell you what year it was being used. It's on state property. Um, and but is it in this century? Oh yes. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh sure. Uh, we have to we have to understand though that uh, late fifties early sixties. Well, it wasn't that. The state has excavated some of it and taken it away, and that may be the problem here. But it's it's a down gradient as far as water flow is concerned from her property. Uh, there have to be a complete environmental study and water study. You're talking a few hundred thousand dollars in order to do that. Um, with wells and azometers and flow ratios and so on. So the entire thing is a, is a, is a very big problem. Um, testing the water is a different issue. Uh, but and, and the town should probably have to consult with your council, but I don't believe that the town should be doing the testing because if it comes back that it's not an environmental hazard caused by the town, then uh, we would not be liable for it. There has to be some, some reason for us to test it. Mm -hmm. And we don't have a reason currently, that's the problem. There is, a, there is an all landfill on state property, and under federal law, I don't know whether that was a town landfill or not at the time, uh, but under federal law, if you purchase property with a, a landfill on it, you are now the recipient of all the problems that may come from that landfill. It, it, it doesn't stay with the original owner, it goes with the new owner. So you have to be very careful about why you, where you buy property. Uh, and, and I'm sure, as Rusty can tell you, in the good old days, mm -hmm. uh, what happened was the people dug a big hole in the backyard and all their trash and everything else, whether it be paint cans full of whatever, uh, would dump that hole and burned. Or if they weren't burned, they were just dumped. Uh, and that you'll find all over the United States. So without knowing what was actually done on that property, there's no real way to understand what should be accomplished here. And is the town responsible in any way uh, for houses being in the wetlands? This probably wasn't wet at the time they built the building because it has a full basement. Um, however, in the last six or seven years, we have sustained an awful lot of water flow from the heavens, uh, which you know, I, I did look at an aerial photo of this particular area. And if you go back in the in the in the uh, aerial photos uh, that are on Google Earth, you can see where what is wet now was not wet five or six mm -hmm. years ago. Yeah. Um, so this material has accumulated. There's no place for it to go, really. Uh, the water is going to stay there until it can get over to Drake's River and disappear mm -hmm. because that's where it's got to go to get from your property and the property abutting you. It's got to go through that area and over to Drake's River. That's the outfall for that whole hmm. area. So it doesn't region. go towards where that dump was to begin with, which is up near Route We're water. talking groundwater. Groundwater. Okay, the, the flow of groundwater on top of the ground from the marsh, uh, which, which is pretty big from what I can see from the, the Google Earth, Earth photos. Um, the landfill, the old landfill that's up on state property, we know that water flow goes away from her property. We know that's, that's the case in that particular area and it goes down into the marsh and out across um, where the end of Landing Road is. So those three or four houses are down there that are almost submerged at times. Uh, it goes in that direction and not in her direction. Uh, 
the best that we know without putting in major well fields and piezometric devices to measure flow and, and the amount of flow and the direction of flow, there's no way of showing that that would be going against gradient. Okay. Mrs. Walsley? Are there no protections for people? Was there a house on this, was the house already built or did no. you build it? I built it. Who, who's looking out for this? The planning board? I mean, who's, who's doing this stuff? The problem is that you have an area of the state of New Hampshire, which is next to the seacoast, which is generally a general floodplain. Well, as, how could the planning climate, board allow uh, building on that? Well, it doesn't it even wasn't have flooded at the time she built. There was no standing water down there at that time. She put in a full basement. She put in French drains around the entire basement to keep water, any water that may come towards the house flowing away. That's terrible. Okay. So what's happened here is the environment has changed. Just yep. like you've noticed all the different storms that we've been getting lately, yeah. the environment has changed yes. because man has fooled around with the environment. And right. What's but, happening is certain lands are now becoming flooded. But some parcels, I mean, you, somebody must have had a clue. I, I'm amazed at this. We followed the, uh, the rules of the planning board 40 years ago and filled in our basement. So it depends really how you look at it and how tall you want your building to be. And it's a decision most people make on their own. Hmm. In her particular case, your, your site was dry when you, when you built it. The back of it wasn't. The back of the it property. Was very right? wet. You're, where you, you put your cellar in was dry, otherwise you wouldn't have got your cellar in. I mean, it, it was, it's always been wet. Even on the heat maps, you'll see yeah. that, they, that it was wet. Lands. Yeah. yeah. Out I was the back 40, of your property, I don't disagree with that. Yeah. But yeah, when you but put your 50. foundation in, mm -hmm. you were able to get it in, and it was not submerged. Water. But if there was already water on that property, that's terrible to let somebody build. But so yeah. one of my neighbors terrible. was approached to sell this property. Um, she refused to sell it. She told these women that I will have to disclose that this land is wetland because she's lived their entire life. And they said, oh, no, 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 then we won't go through you. This is what I'm just finding out. Hmm. So I'm told that it was wetland now mm -hmm. and that she refused to sell it. And so what they did was they had their attorney represent them to sell it yeah. for them and act as their realtor and as their yeah. sales yeah, It sounds like you have some issues <laughs> that are going to have to be done privately. Yeah, it's a mess. Mrs. Uh, yeah, because, Regina? I mean, but, you know, it was, it was sold to me as not wetland. Terrible. Did you take out title insurance? I'm not sure if I took out title. I'm not sure. Well, you purchased the property. I'm Check sure, yes, I'm sure I have a title. That you have title insurance, mm -hmm. okay? You may be able to go back on the insurance company, and you may be able to go back on the people who sold it to you, provided you can get the, the statements that have been made to you, notarized and, and sworn to, mm -hmm. that, that in fact that property was wetland, and the realtor that was trying to that refused to sell it on behalf of these individuals, knew it was wetlands. Yeah. So it, it right. may have so common knowledge in the realty business, you may have it out there. Yeah, because she terrible. rejected to sell it because she would have had to disclose it to me. Yeah. Yeah. So they didn't, they didn't use her. Terrible. Start looking so, at my title insurance if you have some. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, so. I just have one comment about the wetlands. Because you, were, you received a letter from Conservation Commission back in 2006 stating that it was not on the wetlands, but you, right. we still we had the 50-foot buffer back then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that you, you're 40 feet. Right. So you are past the 50-foot buffer. So mm -hmm. I would highly any, recommend doing what the town manager does. Yeah. And, uh, was there any variances or anything? That there was a variance went? just to build a house there. I better let them build Because there was anywhere. nothing there. It was an industrial zone. It was, it was an industrial, industrial zone. She needed a variance to build. So she needed a variance to build it. Right. Was any of that brought up at that time? Well, that would be it was brought before the board from the owner's son to try to get it the, the zoning change. Because they said, I'm not going to buy a piece of property that is not you know, zoned industrial mm -hmm. and so uh, residential. So they went before the board, and they wouldn't change the zone, but they they allowed to have me build a home it's ridiculous. and with a future garage ah. there. So they gave you a variance? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. That's Riddell? awful. Mm. No, it's, you got to go back to the realtor and the, and the attorney that sold it. Okay. Right. I get that statement from the realtor re who refused <coughs> to sell the property. I get it in writing and get it notarized. Yes. Rusty? No, I agree. No. no. 
we'll take it under advisement and you know the town um, attorney will be looking at the results of this meeting tonight but it sounds to me like it's a private issue mm -hmm. due to the wetlands and well the everybody's on the wetlands in Hampton mm -hmm. you know I'm on the wetlands I have the same thing my basement used to look like that too um, did you have iron ochre as well I don't, it was, uh, it looked irony, I will tell you that, Did but I mean, you? not quite as yours yeah. does, but what I'm saying is things do clock. change. Um, I wish that we would have done ridiculous. things differently 40 years ago, and we did fill the basement in, and we could have still done things different that would make it better today. So, you know, mm -hmm. things are constantly evolving, and uh, we'll be, you know, taking a look at this and see if there's any thing that we can recommend. Maybe she should get in touch with the um, planning board too, if, or the zoning board or whoever you dealt with first, and see what they say. But this isn't something that the board of select mm -hmm. might think is going to be able to do a lot yeah. about. Yeah, because I didn't go before the zoning board. The son of these three sisters that sold it did. Yeah. yeah. Well, that sounds to me like that's where the issue is. Yeah. And you're going to have to investigate that somehow. Maybe with a lawyer or whatever. But we, if we see that there's anything we can do, we'll be glad to let you know. Okay, yeah, because I, I really feel it's imperative that I get that water tested. Um, absolute resource, like I said, did test it for the high iron, um, but they have to send it out because there's four phenols that will show up and leachate. So I just think it would be rest and assured to, be to know that it's not leachate in there, yeah. you know, in and my basement. what about the state, Mr. Welch? Yeah. <laughs> can't tell you the state is an unknown quantity in all situations so uh, yeah. I mean I've spent all day in Concord today testifying so yeah. I can tell you it's a complete unknown quantity usually yeah. uh, they'll come back and probably say you need to file something with the Board of Claims which will then probably give you virtually nothing right because everybody that I've talked to and all the research from all the state and everything has said bring it back to your town Right. Yeah. Yeah. So and I this think is where I am. They don't. They don't want to. They don't want to handle it either. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's part of the problem. The thing is, um, the, the town attorney will only really comment on this if this is affects the town. Am I right in saying that? Well, if if it affects the well, if he finds it affects the state, he'll tell us that. Yeah. But I mean, he's he only works for the town. He doesn't. Right. Have, Right, when the state brought up the abandoned dump, too, that's when it raised a red flag, you know, and that's mm -hmm. where, the, where it comes from, you know, the source of the iron. Because it's, it's beyond. I mean, I am totally clogged, so. I, I would know. definitely stop by doing what the town manager okay. said to see if you can get that from uh, your yeah, neighbor. Contact Written. one of the oh, state yeah. reps that yeah. are in here tonight. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Thank you for coming is in. It, well, yes, thank you for hearing me. And, and check you. check with the, the railroad right away, which is right next to you. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay. A uh, hundred and some odd years ago, I can't tell you what they yeah. buried out there. Uh, we removed the the, uh, the abutment ends so that we could level the road out and, and right. make it passable. But uh, there could be something loaded, uh, deposited, or getting rid of in that in that fill that they awesome. used for the embankment. Right, that's right. possible. Too bad it I just don't all. know. Too bad it was passed to sell as a buildable lot. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to the town manager's report. Oh dear. <clears throat> Situation. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, uh, the State Joint Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules will be reviewing proposed rules for the maximum contaminant levels and ambient groundwater quality standards at their July 18, 2018 <coughs> meeting in Concord. Their action may set standards for PFOs in four different categories. The notice also indicated that the rule as um, the, that the rule also dictate the conditions under which treated and untreated wastewater may be discharged to groundwater. This rule may have a long-term financial effect on the town's wastewater treatment plant. Mm -hmm. I don't want to minimize that. We just don't know yet, but uh, when they talk about discharge of wastewater, we do discharge wastewater after it's been treated. Yeah. And we do have test results uh, that show that uh, while we're generally in, in, in conformance with the proposed rule they're making, we are not in conformance with one of the tests. 
the NHMA will be holding a discussion on PFOS, uh, PFOAS, uh, PFAS, excuse me, <laughs> from 9 a.m. to noon on Monday, July 22nd, 219, and their offices in Concord. Pre registration is required, and I understand that we have one member who is going to go. The revaluation is proceeding as planned. The required data entry from April 1st, 2017 to March 31st, 2019 is completed. Building and land values based on sales data and preparing the final reviews uh, is during the month of July. So they're progressing through that now. They're approximately halfway through. Preliminary values should be completed by mid-August with hearings scheduled towards the end of August for individual taxpayers. Uh, that means notices will be going out before the end of August. Okay. Public Works uh, supplemented the trash schedule in efforts on the July 4th period at Hampton Beach to assist in keeping the discarded refuse situation under control during the evenings. The temporary program was highly successful. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Okay, questions for the town manager's report, Mrs. Wolseley? No. I, I have questions. Okay. Um, on the MRI assessed values, so according to their agreement, I, they said that they were going to have the assessments done by July. So now they're saying mid-August with uh, pre preliminary numbers done at the end of August. Is that going to give the Board of Selectmen time to look at their values before they conduct their meetings with the uh, residents? They're supposed to submit a report to the board at the time they complete the values. Um, they have to submit the, the final report in order for the MS-1 to be done for the tax rate to be set. Right. So I can't tell you when they're going to do that because I don't know as at this point in time. What I'm telling you is that it appears that they're going to be sending letters out in time to schedule meetings with taxpayers who have concerns prior to the end of August. Uh -huh. um, but that means that by sending sending those letters out and meeting with the taxpayers, there may be changes in the values, so the final values will not be available until after all those hearings are conducted. Right, and when do we have to set the tax rate? Time, Time frame. Yeah. Well, <coughs> legally, the tax rate doesn't have to be set till March 31st of the following year. Right, but we usually send the bills out. Well, we usually send the bills out sometime in November, payable in December. We're still striking for that that particular period of time. Hmm. Okay, so just we don't know. Otherwise, what happens is that, uh, and I've only been through this once and avoided it, thank goodness, um, taxes, tax rates were established late because of a revaluation and we pushed, and we had the bills sent out before the end of November, so they were due and payable before the end of the year, mm -hmm. so the sums can be used for tax deductions. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, my, concern, my main concern is why their agreement says they're going to be done mid-late July, and now they're saying it's mid-late August. Yeah. So, I mean... Because I, think, I believe the revaluation started late because they were waiting for the contracts to be signed. Good grief. Okay. Mr. Waddell. I'm set. Uh, All set. <coughs> okay. Um, thank you for your report, uh, Mr. Welch. Thank you, sir. Um, moving on to old business, uh, non-union employee compensation. We have uh, Jamie Sullivan here. Good evening. He is here. Good evening. Uh, last time I was here, you folks voted to uh, utilize the funds that were in the budget for non-union raises, but you wanted me to return so that you could decide how you wanted to distribute those. So I'm here to answer questions. You received the paperwork and our recommendations of staff on how we would recommend you distribute those. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mrs. Wolseley. Well, my first question, I guess, is the problem that, and I passed out a little uh, paper to you before everybody sat down this evening, because I've been taking a look at what's happening with this non-union stuff. Um, <coughs> especially the um, recreation department, and this is nothing against uh, <coughs> Renee Boudreau, but I, 
I didn't realize, I have a vague recollection that last year we were asked if uh, we would agree to uh, appoint uh, Mr. Boudreau after uh, Diana Martin left her position. And he has been the, the uh, assistant uh, since then. The, the no, he's been the director since the then. The director, whatever. He, um, there was a mammoth increase in his salary after that. It, it, uh, I, I, I don't understand it. Thank you, my dear, because I've got all this stuff here. Um, he was making 41444 in 15, 42000 in 16, 42973 in 17, and then right after Diana left in 2018, she just worked for, I guess, a month or a couple of months, his salary went to $60,000. Are we out of our minds? No, That's you the promoted minimum him. starting rate for that position. The minimum starting? No, that was, that was the one rate that was established for that position right. at the time. We talked about this the last time I was here. There was one rate for the director's position, yeah. and when he was promoted by Fred to the director's position, so that was his salary. No flexibility there. Because that's one heck of a big... In your consistent dealings with all other department heads when you've promoted them, that's how you've handled it. As I described to you last time, one of the reasons that several other board members wanted to pursue um, researching where we stood in the market and we hired a, an outside group to come in and look at all of our positions, yeah. do comparisons, two things you'll find. One is... Now that recommended and we have accepted a range, which will give you in the future the ability to do it. But the second thing regarding that position is that you'll see, if you look at the MRI report, it's substantially below every comparison. That position, even at its current rate, is below the averages for that position that we used in the comparatives. Well, I wish that I... As Miss Martin had indicated, many, many years, she believed she was underpaid. Yeah. That's why she I just, exactly. It's just, uh, I think it's a shock to see something like that. Uh, I'm, I'm just a little, a little puzzled there. I, I think it would have helped if that was explained at the time he, he was uh, promoted, and it's nothing against him. It's not anything he did. It was explained. I think he was explained. I think we, uh, you know, if you look at, the, at that rate, you know, he got a promotion. That's why his, right. when you look at the years of him, that's yeah. why it For $20,000, I'm sorry. Well, you may be that's sorry, but that's what the position is scheduled at. So, and again, in, in many of these, the non-union positions, and in some cases the union positions, these differences in pay or these gaps in pay exist and that's one of the reasons the majority of the board or the board decided they wanted this study to see where we stood exactly. so that we can deal with that Absolutely correct. so that's where we are and I think most of the people members of the board realize that that's why Diana left that she felt that she had never she felt underpaid right. but she and, had received steady increases and all undervalued. And undervalued and now we're buying our uh, stuff from her at the company she's working for probably in some you know, cases. She's an expert at what she does. Mm. Right. So now, again, before the board, before previously, the memo that was put together uh, was our recommendation of staff of how to apply that money that is there currently. Mm -hmm. right. Essentially, there's three steps we recommend doing. One is address the board's goals of what you set in the budget for last year. You wanted to start, you budgeted to move people halfway. Uh, those folks that identified the MRI study that were below the minimum, you wanted to move them in two steps, and this year was going to be halfway to that minimum. So our recommendation is to deal with that first, and we can do that within the funds that are available, move those people to the halfway point, mm -hmm. then take the balance of the money that's left there and evenly distribute that amongst the other non-union folks, mm -hmm. um, and will stay within the number within that budget. That's how we recommend we proceed. Mm -hmm. The last third part of that is that in, I think, one case or maybe two cases, people might reach the maximum of that. Study. And in that case, we would recommend that be paid as, call it what you will, a one-time payment, a bonus, whatever, but it not affect the base rate 
of their annual salary up to the maximum, but anything above the maximum be paid out as a as a bonus or a one-time payment. I'm going to make a motion that we go along with that recommendation. I'll second that. I have discussion. Please start. Okay. I appreciate what you did. That is what we agreed to last year, but we got a default budget again. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be saying no to that motion, and I'm also going to state why. I oppose blanketing the entire town of Hampton non-union organization with a percentage salary increase in any way. I would prefer to leave the funds in the budget and work towards awarding merits to certain employees after the HR director, assistant town manager, has brought forth and presented who those individuals should be. I have already outlined my own thoughts. Also, please ask yourself, when was the last time that the town of Hampton invested in its public works department, including its department heads? Yep. I may be just getting into my second term as a Hampton selectman, but the entire time has been abundantly clear that the Hampton Public Works Department has been neglected. Every year they are bombarded with more to do. They were the only department that came forward and recognized the default budget right on. The town of Hampton will operate under another default budget in 2020 if we continue on as such appears to be our direction. Default budgets hurt the public works which inevitably hurts the taxpayer. For example, closing the transfer station on Sunday afternoons and cease testing of landfill for PFAS contamination. Now we have to deal with these more conservative levels. I would argue that it is time to stop inflating what has already been inflated and begin to focus on what has not. This includes Town of Hampton employees. We have also have to remember that there are two very hardworking elected officials who would appreciate a salary adjustment, the town clerk and the town tax collector. Mm -hmm. As a selectman, I would support whatever their approach is to ask the taxpayer for one this coming March. Okay, Mr. Waddell. No, I'm all set, I made a motion. Yeah. Sorry. Do you have any further? Um, no. Oh yeah, so um, I would like to also comment on it. Um, I was not in favor of the study to begin with. Uh, but I will tell you, now that we have done it, we've spent a lot of time doing it. Everybody's had their time to comment. I am in favor of doing what you recommend, and I'm in favor of this motion. Mrs. Wolseley. Yeah, just one more thought, um, it, and I'm going to ask you to put this on a subsequent agenda. Uh, I looked, I checked briefly with Fred, and I did look at the town personnel policy. I want to see what had been, I want us to implement what I believe we have done in the past that salaried employees do not earn overtime. Does it have anything to do with this budget? Okay. The, the salaried well, employees do, do not budget. earn overtime. They don't yeah. get paid well, right overtime. Right now we've got a motion here, and that's what you should be commenting on. But we, All those in favor. But if you will put have, that on a future are you in agenda. Favor or against? No, I am not in okay, favor. Okay, we have Regina against. Yes. We have three, four, and two against. Very good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we have the discussion about the representative to the Heritage Commission. Is there new information on that, Mr. Welch? Not that I'm aware of, Mr. Chairman. This is the Selectman's representative. Oh. Does, and I believe, did you say you wanted to be on that, Mrs. Goldsley? Um, I thought I remember you commenting. Yeah, uh, I thought we made a list. Didn't yeah, we make a list? Yeah, and I thought list? you were the one. A while one. ago, yeah, I thought so, too. I, thought, I think you are the one. We had a list that, yeah. yeah. You, did don't, you did offer. Because I so, think we had two people, one yeah. and then another. Yeah. I don't there remember where I put it, but I remember. You need to do a formal appointment. A formal <laughs> appointment. Because it requires you to take an oath. Because it's a statutory committee. So, therefore, the board has to vote it, and then we have it signed. Is, uh, I'll be glad to nominate Mrs. Wolseley. She did express interest in it. All right, second. All those in favor? Four. I'll abstain. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and uh, there, there is kind of some excitement. Of, there's more excitement about it now than there ever was. So hopefully something good will happen there. That'd be great. Um, any other old business? Moving on to new business, we have the three-way stop sign at Moulton and Morningside Roads. Mr. Welch? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we'd, we would recommend that the board and their executive authority under the statute go ahead and, and authorize a three-way stop sign from Moulton and Morningside Roads. I'll make so that move. motion. Oh. 
I'll second. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? That's unanimous. Uh, next, we have the PA28 inventory taxable property 2020 vote not to use. Mr. Welch? Mr. Chairman, we would uh, suggest to the board that they vote not to utilize the PA28 inventory form because it will require a report from every property owner in the town, which will then uh. have to be put together and, and reviewed by the, uh, the assessing department, and there would be a heavy penalty for those who didn't file. I will, I will so move that we proceed to vote not to use. I'll second it. All those in favor? Unanimous. Uh, the Hampton Falls Dispatch Agreement. Mr. Welch. Mr. Chairman, uh, the members of the board, we have a dispatch agreement with the Hampton Falls Fire Department, <clears throat> which is uh, very successful. Uh, our fire chief recommends that it be continued. Uh, it does not overburden our operations and it assists in, in mutual aid calls. Mm -hmm. I will so move that we accept or agree. I'll second it. Are you voting? Or? What's that? Hampton Falls. <laughs> Hampton Falls. <laughs> dispatch. Continue the dispatch agreement for another yes, five years. Yes, got a motion in a second. Okay. All those in favor. Oh, I didn't vote? No. You're the, you're the chairman right now because he's... <laughs> oh, he's gone. <laughs> yeah. So four. Oh, I'm sorry. He went and visited. Yeah. All right. Repeal the 1969 Warner Lane Roberts Drive sewer billing contracts. Mr. Chairman, uh, in reviewing He's the back. Warner Lane agreement with the town of uh, Exeter, uh, we discovered that the board had voted on October 17, 1969 to um, issue those contracts to everybody on Warner Lane, and they were going to be billed for sewer. Uh, that has now been added to the tax rate, so doing this is inconsistent with what we're doing. We're suggesting the board repeal it so there's no misunderstanding. Oh, good. I'll make the motion. Second. I'll second it. Oh. All those in favor? <coughs> Unanimous. Can you stand one more? Uh, I have one thing, too. Observation? Yeah. It is outrageous to be sitting here at 1030 at night. You've got to eat the schedule better. People have voted, Mrs. You've Lowe's got to eat the schedule. And I'm trying to accommodate you, and that's why we're here till you, 1030. You this got, is, uh, no, that's uh, not what I was I just have requests for upcoming agenda items that I've already asked the chairman for. Um, ethics policy, yeah. town of Hampton as an organization, and an appointment with the assessing department, however town council sees fit. We've already and talked about that, and Mr. Sullivan is taking care of uh, the assessing department. He's going to come up with something about that. And um, as far as the MRI, um, if, do we want to bring that up when we're all in the midst of this, what's going on now, or do we want to see what they're going to offer and what they're going to do. So do I get a feeling here? Um, do we want to tr uh, try to investigate to change horses in midstream? No, I I'm not. That's not what I'm suggesting. I'm, I want to make sure that we see the numbers in, uh, before they go, before they start scheduling <clears throat> well, with taxpayers. we will be talking to... Per uh, their schedule originally said in the contract that we signed. I don't have any... I think I'm, Mr. Welch has already commented on that. And yeah, as far okay. as the ethics is concerned, what do you want to discuss? Well, you had we had talked about a few What do you want to discuss? I want to talk to about what it means for the board. <clears throat> um, we talked about other boards and whether or not they have adopted our policy. Yeah, but what problem have we do you adopted? have that we can isolate that the rest of us can study? To we, review I, it and see how it affects <clears throat> us. I think it well, should be a discussion. Well, we've all had copies of the ethics yeah. uh, thing because it comes to the same thing with the RSA. I think most people have are familiar with it, and is there some part of it that you feel isn't being dealt with correctly? I'm not sure. I think we need to discuss it as a board. Well, we, we also need to discuss conflicts of interest, and we need to that's discuss ethics policy. And we yes, and we need to. Okay, then uh, why don't we use that as part of what your go? I don't. I personally do not feel the need to go over the whole ethics policy. I don't either. If somebody's got a no. problem, bring up the problem. Yes, because we have not had one person complain. We've worked on this extensively. 
Uh, and if you have any problems, you need to take a look at it problems. and bring it up. Mrs. Wolsey and, just brought up about the... Um, and, and I want to see us uh, adding to the personnel policy that salaried employees do not earn Okay, overtime. well, we are going to talk about this in a private meeting because I believe that's private, right? Isn't it, Mr. Welch? If you're going to talk about individual employees, who, and, and you would have to in order to do that... I, don't mean individual, I mean just salaried employees, just that category. If you're going to amend the personnel ordinance, you don't need a non-public session to do that. Right. Okay. However, by definition, salaried employees don't get paid overtime. Don't get paid overtime. But right. they right. are being paid overtime. Actually, they're not. They're, well, yes. being, they're being paid uh, for taking uh, work schedules for private individuals, which makes the town money. No. Yes. I make a motion to adjourn at 2228. Well, let's wait. Let's Second. just wait and for one moment to get this cleared up because it's, I do have a problem. I'm getting haunted constantly about what we should do. We've gone through these things over and over again, and I don't really feel that unless you have a problem, that you can bring it forward, and Mrs. Wilsley has identified a problem, and we will have... Uh, Jane. I'll be happy to make up an amendment with uh, with our deputy town manager and uh, see what we can bring forward. For okay, the so that review. will be on the agenda next, next week, week or week next after. meeting. Yeah. Yes, that we will take that and we will bring it. And if any other complaints that you want to discuss, um, Regina, bring, let us know what they are so we can all study about it. We're not going to. Uh, I've sent emails on all this. I know, but what uh, your emails? I'm sorry. I, find, I've, I have checked every one of them out, and I've asked if those are things that we should be talking about, and I'm told differently. So well, why we, can't we, we can talk about them in whatever format the well, board wants. But. I don't think the board, uh, from what we've just said, the ethics thing, that we have a problem, Mrs. Wolsey brought it up, that's what we're going to discuss. We're not going to discuss the whole Fine, book. conflicts if of interest, fine. If you want to fine. study it yourself and I've go around and talk to everyone, and if you dis discover a problem, identify it, and we will talk about it. And the chairman needs to structure <laughs> do it in meeting. the meetings. I, d I object to being here past 10 o'clock. Okay, then you're welcome to leave. We have uh, a motion that we adjourn. Thank Second. you. All, All those in favor? Session 2, Unanimous. Planning Board, town, uh, Master Town Plan this Wednesday. Ooh.